March 11, 2004. A Canadian family in Vancouver have just finished a delicious dinner of pork loin wrapped in smoked bacon when a provincial health official appears on the TV and announces some very worrying news. That meal that they just wolfed down might have had a secret ingredient, the flesh and guts of numerous murdered women, meat that might make them seriously ill. When they heard that news, one of Canada's most prolific and demented serial killers was in custody. No thanks to the Canadian cops who seemed to always allow this guy to keep on killing. Did they? That's doubtful, but what is not doubtful is that this is one of the most disturbing, perplexing, and nauseating serial killer cases in history, a story that might contain some extremely dark secrets. Robert Picton was a meat lover. His entire life was centered around meat, almost from the day he was born. Seems he couldn't get enough of the stuff and he certainly wasn't too picky about where it came from. Born on October 24, 1949, Picton cut his teeth on the family pig farm 17 miles to the east of downtown Vancouver. As with many serial killers, his childhood was far from pleasant. To understand the extremely revolting things you'll hear in this show, you need to know what shaped this madman. He wasn't always a monster. Little Robert, or Willie as he was unaffectionately known, was molded into a beast by perhaps the worst parents a boy could ever have. Willie and his young brother David grew up on the farm, while their sister Linda was sent away when she was young. Her parents said the farm life wasn't suited for a young girl. They were absolutely right. This story is about Willie, but bear in mind as we tell you this tale that his siblings might have also embraced a dark streak. Willie and David slaved away on the pig farm from a very young age. Their father, Leonard, born in England in 1896, was a very violent man. He ignored the kids as much as possible, interacting with them only to dish out the occasional physical and psychological abuse. Leonard was not a nice man. Evident in one story that Willie would tell police many years later, it was about this time that he was 12 and bought a three-week-old calf. He liked the calf and made it his pet. Then one day he came home from school and it wasn't there. He asked his dad about it and he was told, oh, it must have got out. Willie replied, how can it get out the door? His father remained silent. Willie ran to the barn where he found his half-butchered pet hanging from a meat hook. He told his mother Louise, I was going to keep that calf for the rest of my life and now it's gone. Crying, he told her, I was going to sleep with it. He loved that calf, which was now a butchered piece of meat. Somewhere in the kid's mind, the trauma he experienced had connected love and violence, affection and slaughter. He would tell this story later in life as if that pet calf was the most important thing that ever happened to him. He explained to detectives that losing his beloved calf made him realize from a young age, life goes around and around. You're only here today, you're not here tomorrow. You should keep those details in mind, since Willie's actions later in life are still a matter of debate. His childhood might hold the keys to what is a very murky mystery. Unsurprisingly, these kids stayed away from their father, but their mother, Louise, born in Alberta in 1912, was also the embodiment of parental mismanagement. This gruesome guardian was loud, controlling, and obnoxious. She didn't look too good for her age, her balding head usually covered by a scarf, hair sprouting out of her chin, and her mouth containing just a few rotten teeth. She wouldn't have looked or sounded out of place in the movie Deliverance. She called Willie slow, a boy she believed was not quite right in the head, blaming the fact that when he was born, his umbilical cord had wrapped around his neck and cut off his oxygen. All she ever seemed to do was shout at him. She was often heard screaming, get over here now, and he always came running. She worked both kids like coal miners up at dawn every day to slop out the pig feces. 200 pigs plus the eight cows the kids had to slop out and milk in the morning. Both kids stank like something rotten since Luis never taught them the importance of regular bathing. Willie was taunted in school for that. The other kids at Millside Elementary named him Stinky Piggy, and when he got home, he was faced with more hard work, often witness to the slaughtering of livestock. Death was always around him, but blood and guts didn't bother young Willie. When the adults were angry at him, he'd sometimes go hide under the gutted pig carcasses. Forevermore, death, blood, and viscera would for Willie be associated with safety. The Pictons were very well known in their town, Port Coquitlam, population 50,000, for having one of the biggest pig farms and slaughterhouses in the area. If you wanted pork, L.F. Picton Ranch Poultry and Pigs was the place to go. When people visited, they'd see the feral, unwashed kids running around a house that always seemed on the verge of collapse. This they couldn't understand. Everyone knew the Pictons had money from selling land. It was as if they enjoyed living in abject filth. 
pigs, chicken, ducks, dogs, and the occasional cow wandered around the house, leaving dirt and excrement behind. A farmer who lived nearby later recalled, It was just one shack after another made up of scraps of lumber. I didn't go down there, it was so repulsive. Willie, who had a good memory despite his low IQ, later recalled how when he was two, there was no running water in the house. At that time, his bedroom was a converted chicken coop where he could lift a floorboard under his bed and get cold water from the spring below. Despite the obvious maltreatment, Louise said she loved Willie dearly. She protected him from his father. She doted on him when she wasn't treating him like a slave. Feeling sorry for her boy, who was put into the special education class at school, Due to low grades and the fact that he looked and smelled like an animal and didn't talk like other kids who wore nicer clothes, many of those kids were the children of doctors who worked at the local Essendale Mental Hospital. One of them many years later admitted, We were all terrible to the Pictons, especially Robert. No one liked Stinky Willie in school, so he was surprised one day when a girl named Lisa started being nice to him. Willie was working in the store his family had on Shaughnessy Street in Port Coquitlam, a shop they named The Meat Locker. That day, he stared at Lisa, her face slightly unique as her mother was Chinese and her father Caucasian. She smiled back at him. The smell didn't repulse her, so he gave her a free hot dog. Many years later, he'd meet Lisa again. They'd become good friends. She was probably his only friend. Lisa would also hold some of the keys that we talked about that may solve the mystery of Willie. More on that later. Rather than waste his time at school, Luis pulled him out when he was 14. He continued working at the farm and also worked as a butcher, slaving away in the back, cutting meat all day. Willie became very skilled at this. One of the pivotal moments in his life came when his brother David was 16 and learning to drive. For whatever reason, David somehow didn't see a kid walking down the road. The kid was 14-year-old Tim Barrett, who was hit so hard the truck was badly bashed up. It seemed as if David had not even slowed down or braked. Instead of doing the right thing and telling the cops, David sped off and went to tell his mother. She raced out to the accident scene, looked at the kid, who she thought was obviously dead, and rolled him into a water-filled ditch about 10 yards from the road. This had a big impact on David and Willie, who already had a warped sense of right and wrong. Tim's parents, Philip and Lois Barrett, reported their son missing. His body was found the next day. The disturbing thing about this is the autopsy revealed he died from drowning not the injuries sustained when he was hit, although there were significant head injuries and a fractured pelvis. Even so, the pathologist said those injuries would not have killed Tim. Luis was now a killer, David was an accessory, and Willie learned a thing or two about ethics and accountability. David and his mom were both exposed in the investigation due to a mechanic telling police he'd fixed the Picton's truck, but in the end, Luis wasn't charged with a crime and David only got four years probation after being sentenced at a juvenile court. Many years later, Willie would tell this story about how his mother pretty much got away with murder. In 1978, Willie's father, Leonard, passed away at the age of 91, the same year that a fire at the farm killed hundreds of pigs. Then a year later, Luis also passed away. The kids, including the sister, inherited the land, land that was worth a substantial amount of money. They also each received about $90,000 around $380,000 in today's money. That was small change though. The farm and its land were now worth close to a million dollars, or $4.2 million today. Willie, who was now 20, was suddenly rich, but he remained at the farm as his mother had requested in her will. Now all the animals were his. He still barely took care of the place and never really got into the old hygiene thing, but he did make some changes. One of those changes was taking care of the animals he loved. When his favorite horse, Goldie, died, he decapitated it and took the head to a taxidermist. Goldie's stuffed head was still on his bedroom wall years later when the horrors of the Picton farm came to light. Willie had never had a girlfriend. The girl in his family's meat shop, Lisa, was about the closest he'd come to falling in love. The puppy kind, at least. Willie was aware that girls were disgusted by him, the pig boy who smelled like feces. So he found pen pals. Pen pals didn't know what he smelled or looked like. Just prior to his parents dying, the teenager Willie fell for Connie Anderson, a girl he was writing to in Pontiac, Michigan. He took a few long road trips to the US where he called on the pen pals in Chicago, Kansas City, and St. Louis. But it was with Connie, a rather heavyset girl, that he found true love. The two were both oddballs and not popular amongst their peers. They didn't bother with bars and restaurants, they just drove around all the time. Willie spent five weeks with her and they later got engaged despite never sleeping with each other. The only thing Willie had slept with until then was 
pigs, pigs he sometime had to slaughter. He seemed to have trouble differentiating women from swine, which may have been why he and Connie never reached third base. Fourth base, with Willie, usually meant the meat grinder. One night he told her he couldn't leave the farm forever, he had to go. Years later he told the police she was supposed to come up, but she never did. Neither did he ever go back to Pontiac. Well, that's life, Willie told interrogators decades later. Life comes around and goes around, and in between for Willie at least there's a fair amount of bloodshed and pain. He was almost ready, primed to kill, to become a slaughterer and a meat man who would shock the world. Back at the farm Willie did something unexpected. He opened the place up to the Hells Angels gang that hung around the area. From then on, there were wild parties at the farm. The bikers turned some of it into a chop shop and held cockfights in the barns. For them, Willie was just a weirdo sitting on a lot of money. As long as he let them party, they were good to him. They called the place Piggy Palace, always dumbfounded by Willie's relationship with his pigs, especially his 600-pound boar that would run wild around the place. They called Willie weird and slow. They laughed at him behind his back, but they sure did appreciate the use of his place. It was through the bikers and the parties that Willie met many women, women who worked the streets and most of the rundown areas of Vancouver. They partied with the bikers, often given the substances that got them through their day. Willie was equally as kind. Well, he seemed kind at first. In the daytime, Willie would take his meat to West Coast Reduction Rendering Facility, where the non-edible parts would be rendered into grease to make soap, candy, and cosmetics. Some of it was turned into pet food. Unbeknownst to the facility, it might have been part human. At nighttime, the parties would get louder and louder. This was kind of legal. In 1996, Willie and David registered a non-profit organization they named Piggy Palace Good Time Society, stating that it was for special events, functions, dances, shows, and exhibitions. It was more like a rave organization in which the brothers used a converted building at the pig farm for hundreds of people to party in including a regular cast of downtown Vancouver's East Side prostitutes. One of the parties drew 1,800 people. Young folks danced away the night, oblivious to the danger they were in. It was fertile ground for a serial killer. The brothers fell foul of the law a few times, sometimes for violating city zoning ordinance and other times for holding parties with too many people and for not writing up mandatory financial statements. But Willie didn't cross in the radar of cops for his more violent proclivities until 1997 after he stabbed a prostitute named Wendy Lynn Eistetter. Willie was now 48. This woman was certainly not the first that Willie hurt, but it was the first time he got caught. He was sloppy. Her experience tells us something about how Willie worked. He picked Wendy up on the street in eastern downtown Vancouver and offered her a hundred bucks. She became suspicious when she saw a bra in his van, but she went to his house, which she called a pigsty. She later said something didn't feel right. She explained, I asked him for a telephone book and he showed me a telephone book. And as I was leaning over the desk looking up a phone number, I could feel behind me. The next thing she knew, there was a handcuff on her arm. But she fought him, managing to pick up a knife, stabbing him near his throat. He screamed, you bleep, you got me good. He subsequently picked up a knife and stabbed her in the abdomen. The next thing she knew, they were outside fighting near his truck. He had her in his arms as she pleaded, I have a family, I'll give you a thousand dollars if you let me go. She said he suddenly became heavy against her body as if he were passing out from blood loss. She ran for it, leaving him staggering in the driveway. She was picked up on the highway at 1.45 a.m., seen by the driver Ben Streleski and his girlfriend. She was handcuffed, covered in blood and holding a knife, quite a frightening sight for the couple. The last thing Wendy remembers saying to them was, in case I die, tell them that I stabbed him in the neck. She didn't die. Willie was charged with attempted murder and released on a $2,000 bond after telling the cops she tried to steal from him and had gone bananas in the process. A few months later, the case was dismissed, which was not unusual for cases involving so-called women of the night. The cops later had to explain this to a disgruntled public, and they admitted they dropped the cases because such women with addiction problems didn't make good witnesses. This would come back to bite the Canadian police big time. Many prostitutes went to the farm. They'd often knew something dark lurked amongst the piles of animal excrement and broken shacks. They'd heard about Weird Willie, who mostly kept a low profile at the parties. It was common knowledge amongst the sex workers that Piggy Palace was a dangerous place, but they went there anyway knowing the booze and whatever else often came free, or at least for favors. When they arrived there for the first time, they were greeted by a sign at the farm entrance that read, This property protected by Pitbull with AIDS. 
Willie couldn't even get the English right. One woman who went there one time later said that farm was the dregs of the earth. It was a hellhole. She said women went anyway just for what was on offer. She said the cops always knew about what went on there, but they left the place alone for some reason. They could have shut it down whenever they wanted to, but they didn't. Many women who survived that farm still wonder why. In the 1980s and the 1990s, scores of women went missing in Vancouver, many of whom worked the streets at night. Such women have been called the less dead, meaning that when they die, no one really cares about them. In the eyes of society, they hardly existed when they were alive, and when they went missing, they still barely existed. They were less dead in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of conventional society, despite their vulnerability and hardships. After all, they hung out on the east side of downtown, a place known as Low Track and Canada's Skid Row. This 10-block section of the city was an absolute wasteland, where the sidewalks were covered with the rubber and spiked jetsam the women in the attics had dumped in the night. Pimps strolled among the many liquor stores and pawn shops. Biker gangs and Asian cartels openly flaunted their wares. Oddballs like Willie were invisible in this civic failure. Within those 10 blocks were the highest rates of HIV infection in the whole of North America. Young runaways, sometimes referred to as Twinkies, would often end up there. It was the last stop on the line of a broken life for many, the plug hole of society that sucked in the tormented and traumatized. No gutter was deeper and dirtier than the east side of downtown. These mean streets were a neglected and rejected gaping wound oozing human pus that presented some troubling questions about modern Western society. And because of Willie and his victims, soon those questions would have to be confronted. The women talked amongst themselves about this girl or that girl who went out for a job and never returned. The pimps started to wonder what was going on when this happened time and again. We're not talking about a handful of women here, we're talking about dozens of women over the years. One of them was Rebecca Guno, who on a hot summer's day in 1983 vanished from downtown east side, never to be seen again. By the time Vancouver's World Fair happened in 1986, aka Expo 86, more women had gone missing. Some of them last seen at the intersection of Maine and Hastings, the bottom of rock bottom. A face often seen lurking around that intersection was Willie Pickton, the weird guy who held those huge parties at his rundown farm. 43-year-old Sherry Rail went missing, followed by 33-year-old Elaine Auerbach, who told her buddies that she was moving to Seattle but never arrived. Then there was Teresa Ann Williams, a 26-year-old Aboriginal woman who went missing in July 1988, but was only reported missing in March 1989. There was a hiatus of over a year until a 40-year-old psychiatric patient named Ingrid Suet vanished. In 1992, 39-year-old Kathleen Watley went missing. There was another break, and three years later, 47-year-old Catherine Gonzalez vanished into thin air. She wasn't reported missing until February 9, 1996. It took seven months for 32-year-old Catherine Knight to be reported missing, who disappeared shortly before Dorothy Spence, a 36-year-old Aboriginal woman. That Christmas, 23-year-old Diana Melnick also vanished. The youngest victim at the time was Stephanie Lee, a 20-year-old woman who just vanished after being treated for psychosis. Tanya Holyak was just 24, and Olivia Williams was just 22 when they disappeared around the same time. Unbelievably, a woman named Janet Henry survived a close call in the 80s with a serial killer named Clifford Olson, and on June 28, 1997, she also disappeared. After a 29-year-old black woman named Sarah Jane DeVries vanished in 1998, police found her diary. In it, she'd written, I feel like I've come a long way on my journey. I feel like I've overcome a lot of stuff. Inspector Kim Rosmo of the Vancouver Police figured around 40 women had gone missing, most of them from the downtown east side. Even so, police still weren't sure the many missing women had been murdered. Rosmo employed a new geographic profiling technique, but despite the huge number of deaths, the case never became a major murder investigation. It was believed such women often go missing and then turn up in some other place like LA or Vegas. The cops were very wrong, but they didn't even have one body at this point. They had no forensic evidence. It didn't help matters that some of the sex workers and the gangs and the pimps were reluctant to speak with them, for good reason, of course. The police then went to the families of some of the missing women in an attempt to attain their DNA. They entered the DNA into databases in North America, trying to match it with the DNA of Jane Doe's from Alberta to Arizona. They checked the hospitals, mental health facilities, drug rehabilitation facilities, and witness protection programs, and they came up empty-handed. These women really had vanished off the face of the planet. And as the years passed, 97, 98, 99, more women disappeared. 
Julie Young, age 31, Angela Jardine, 28, Michelle Gurney, 30, Marcella Creason, 20. The latter was released from jail on December 27, 1998 and was not seen after. Her mother and her boyfriend waited for her at their apartment where they cooked her a belated Christmas feast. Some men were questioned, men who had a history of violence, but none of them, it seemed, had anything to do with the disappearances. The cops checked the downtown Eastside Youth Activities Society's bad date file, where women had filed many pages regarding men to avoid. Willie's name was not on that list, mostly because if you met him, you were dead. One thing the police should have done is listen to 37-year-old Bill Hiscox. This widower had almost lost his life through alcohol after his wife passed, but his sister saved him when she helped him land a job at P&B Salvage in Surrey, southeast of Vancouver. The owners of this firm were Robert William Willie Picton and David Picton. When Hiscox collected his weekly paychecks, he had to go to the Port Coquitlam pig farm, which he later described as a creepy-looking place, where the equally creepy and quiet Willie Picton parked his beloved converted bus with deeply tinted windows. But what bothered Hiscox was the wild parties and the fact that so many sex workers turned up there. He'd read about the missing women in the newspapers, and then when he heard about Willie's stabbing charge, he thought about something else. What he told the police hotline was, all the purses and IDs that are out there in his trailer and stuff. Hiscox first gave that information to the hotline anonymously, but later he met with a detective, a man we'll discuss in detail later. That detective told him that he'd pushed the investigation all the way to the top of the police force, but after that cop was transferred off the case, the brothers were filed as persons of interest and left alone. The farm was not surveilled, which was a god-awful pity because Willie took a lot more women there in the 90s. In fact, cops were now pulling up names of missing women. There must have been over 50. Even so, it seemed at times the Vancouver Sun newspaper cared more about those women than the police. The cops were still unwilling to call this a serial murder case. If it were, it would have been the worst serial killing case in Canada's history. It took until 2001 for the police to finally form the Missing Women Task Force. By now, they had 54 missing women, possibly as many as 70, who'd all disappeared from the same area in the 80s and 90s. And so, 18 years too late, Canada's largest murder investigation finally began. Even so, they still issued a statement to the public saying, we're in no way saying there's a serial murderer out there. We're in no way saying that all these people missing are dead. It seemed to many people at the time, especially the women still working the streets, that the cops didn't want to admit they'd allowed a serial killer to remain loose for almost two decades. The Picton men's names stood out, both of whom had a rap sheet. They then looked at a 1998 report when Bill Hiscox had phoned Crime Stoppers about the farm. Fourteen more women had gone missing since then. Police noted that Hiscox had accused Willie of being a sicko. He told them in 1998 about those ten purses he'd seen with his own eyes, and he explained that Willie had once bragged about being able to easily dispose of bodies. He explained a friend of Willie's, the mixed-race Chinese-Caucasian woman named Lisa Yelts, had told him that she'd seen women's bloody clothing at the farm, as well as various women's belongings. This was free hot dog Lisa from Willie's childhood. She suggested to Hiscox that the belongings might be Willie's trophies. Even worse, Hiscox heard that Willie got rid of these women with his meat grinder and possibly sold the meat to the public. That might have sounded like too much of a tall story back to the cops in 98, but in 2001, they realized they should look into this again. It wasn't until 2002 that there was a breakthrough, and even that was accidental. A rookie police officer was the first policeman to find something notable on the farm. It seemed the homicide detectives were still stalling, but this rookie cop got a warrant to search the farm for illegal guns, not pieces of ground-up women. He found the guns, but he also found a bunch of personal items belonging to women, including an asthma inhaler on which was printed the name of one of the missing women. So it was this young cop, who wasn't even on the murder case, that was the cause of the subsequent forensic search of the entire farm. A farm, by the way, that was worth about $70 million. Why this guy lived in such squalor, police just couldn't fathom. What they eventually found at the farm were the remains of at least 27 women, parts of them in the freezers and lots of them mulched up into pig feet. Worse, it seemed to cops that Willie had used human flesh and whatever other parts for pork products. Even so, it wasn't until 2004 that officials appeared on TV warning Canadians they might well have become unwitting cannibals. Don't worry, said one official, explaining that they'd probably not get sick from it and then only possibly contract hepatitis B if they hadn't cooked the pork well enough. Given the size of Willie's operation, 
There were a lot of sick Canadians for a few weeks after that announcement, especially when the Canadian government ordered a federal health risk assessment study to understand if people who ate the part human meat could have come into contact with viruses, bacteria, and parasites, or contracted diseases such as HIV and hepatitis. Both these diseases were very common in Vancouver among the highly stigmatized prostitutes. They concluded the risk was low to medium, but that didn't make people feel much better. Willie had been murdering and selling meat products for 20 years, so God knows how many people were reluctant cannibals if he had put victims into his products. It was a great time to be a vegetarian in the Vancouver area. People asked how the hell police had let this go on for so long. They would heard about Hiscox and the fact that many women had died after he told police what he knew. Maggie Guile, known on the streets as Crazy Jackie, told the press 27 of her buddies were confirmed murdered and over 50 were missing. She added, there are many more that the police won't add to the list. Whole buildings of women have disappeared, but no one's looking for them. Many of the victims weren't white, which led to accusations of racism and sexism. One thing was for certain, those women were less dead in the eyes of the cops. Now let's talk about Willie's interrogation. At the station, Willie is quiet, giving one or two word answers to questions, only to explode with vivid descriptions of his past when he starts to talk about his dead calf or how his father was harsh with him. To his interrogators, he seems a few sandwiches short of a picnic, as the saying goes. Willie refers to himself as the pig man, seemingly impressed when telling investigators repeatedly that his face is in the newspapers. At one point, he stares at the poster board with pictures of dozens of missing women he supposedly murdered and churned up. After being asked about them, he turns to Sergeant Bill Forty and says, There's so many millions of people out there, they look so much, so much alike, and everything else you know. Then he starts talking about how he was once mauled by a bull and another time chased by a black bear. Instead of discussing the case, he explains to the bemused cops, That was a scary feeling, that one, referring to the bull attack. Turn the other hoof and if your arm's out there, rip your arm right off. Talking about once trying to split up two boars while fighting over a sow in heat, he excitedly explains, I got in between them and then they went after me, got all slashed up. What on earth did the police have on their hands here? Those are the good old days, Willie says. Those are the days when I could say I got scars and really enjoyed myself, all black and blue. Detective Forty cuts in. You do know you're never going back to that farm or that life. Willie then says there's nothing he likes about the farm anyway. Meanwhile, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were saying that in the last two decades, 144 prostitutes had been murdered or are missing in British Columbia, with foul play suspected. Soon, Vancouver will be sued for not doing their job. Families of victims will come forward to reprimand the cops, who certainly would not have acted in the same fashion had scores of middle-class women gone missing. The farm was fenced off as forensics did their job. It was thought many of the bodies had already been eaten or were possibly sitting in someone's freezer somewhere, in parts anyway. In Willie's house, they found what looked like instruments of torture, kinky devices, and syringes filled with liquid. They found parts of a woman in a wood chipper. It seemed that Willie had strangled most of them, possibly after knocking them out with a substance, maybe windshield cleaner, after which he slaughtered them the same way he did his pigs. According to the court transcripts, he told an undercover police officer, I filled the syringes up with antifreeze, and you inject this stuff and you're dead in about 5-10 to 10 minutes. He also likely shot some of the victims, and many of them had their bones cut with Willie's handheld reciprocating saw. But many of the women, the very last shreds of them, were missing completely, leading some people to question if Slow Willie was being set up. Canadian news outlets did not discuss the very worst details. AP issued a report asking anyone who may still have frozen pork products from Picton's farm to return those products to the police. More shock followed when a woman named Lynn Ellingson came forward and said she'd once seen Willie skinning a woman hanging from a meat hook. She was blackmailed by Willie and didn't say anything anyway out of fear for her life, but the friend at the time had tipped off the police. This friend told them that Willie made strange meat, and he explained in detail how Ellingson had seen Willie strip a body down. She told him she was surprised when she saw that human fat was yellow, not white. The testimony sounded like the real thing. Detective Constable Lorimer Shanner was the one who took the tip and the one who'd first dealt with Hiscox in 1998, but he said as much as he wanted to search the farm, he couldn't because it fell under the jurisdiction of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They apparently talked with Ellingson on two occasions, but each time she remained silent. Shanner later said that the RCMP visited the farm but were told to come back when Willie and David weren't so busy. For whatever reason, they actually did that. 
they interviewed Willie again and he told them that they could search the farm, but according to Shannard, they never even returned. God knows why. The investigation was botched with a capital B. Shanner said he had nightmares because of those missing women, and later he had to be taken off the case due to PTSD. This also slowed the investigation down as Shanner was on to Willie more than anyone else was. In total, there were more than 40,000 photos taken of the crime scene. 235,000 items were taken from the farm, while the lab received a massive 600,000 exhibits. For the prosecution, 98 testified, and another 30 testified for the defense. It was a long and gruesome trial. Willie admitted to killing 49 women, but not at trial. He told an undercover officer while in custody that he wanted to make it 50. He was charged with killing 26 and convicted of just six murders. He was found innocent of first-degree murder but guilty of second-degree murder, likely because the jury didn't think the prosecution had proved beyond any reasonable doubt that he'd planned the murders. The deputy chief constable of the Vancouver Police Department apologized, saying in a statement, I wish from the bottom of my heart that we would have caught him sooner. I wish that all the mistakes that were made we could undo, and I wish that more lives would have been saved. More people came forward to say they knew Willie, some had survived the usually deadly encounter with him. In 1985, he picked out a sex worker named Tracy Bunyan. He took her back to the disgusting trailer which she immediately saw was stacked with women's clothes. Willie physically hurt her, but then drove her back to the city, warning her on the way that he was giving her one more chance to clean up her act or she was getting it like the others. His belief that he was helping women was just an excuse to justify his perverted, murderous acts. There were other survivors, such as Lenore, not her real name, a self-described hardcore alcoholic who was in and out of foster homes all her childhood, experiencing the most horrific kind of existence a child could have. She said Willie picked her up in a white van, but when she saw the rear seats had been removed, she knew something was wrong. She asked him to stop the car, but he kept driving, and in the end, she had to jump out. She later saw Willie's face in the newspaper. In 2007, Judge Justice James Williams sentenced Willie to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 25 years, meaning his parole date is coming up soon. In 2035, Willie is 73 now, currently serving out a sentence at Port Cartier Maximum Security Prison in Quebec, where he still claims he's innocent. In 2008, David Pickton and Linda Wright sued the Attorney General and Solicitor General of British Columbia. They said the police destroyed much of the farm in their search, saying they disturbed, disrupted, killed and destroyed various plants, trees, ground covers and other vegetation. They'd been pretty quiet about their brother, which isn't surprising given that the four children of four victims had sued them, saying they knew all along what their brother was doing on that farm. Many serious allegations have been made against David over the years, but he's denied everything and filed statements of defense. In 2016, the book Willie wrote in prison, titled Picton in his own words, was published after the manuscript was smuggled out of the prison. The book was soon withdrawn due to the public outcry. In the book, he claimed the Royal Canadian Mounted Police made him a fall guy for the murders. He stated that some of the body parts found on his farm were in cars he'd bought at a police auction and that some women were killed by the Hells Angels when he held those parties. He even claimed that the blood of one victim that police found on a mattress was nothing but spilled wallpaper glue. But before the book was taken down, a reviewer said it was incoherent, illiterate ranting, while another reviewer said, it is tedious and boring drivel filled with tirades against the police, asinine theories about the Hells Angels. Nothing Willie says in the book sounds remotely true, but he has some conspiracy theorists on his side. They've asked why did the Vancouver cops not investigate the case for so long, even when they'd been told about the women's purses and a sicko who stripped the flesh of a woman? Why wasn't the farm at least put under police surveillance? If he murdered 49 or even 26, they say it's strange that even with the most advanced forensics equipment, they could only convict Willie of six murders. Willie himself managed to write to people from prison. In one of the letters, letters filled with umpteen spelling mistakes, he said, I, myself, is not from this world, but I am born into this world through my earthly mother, and if I had to change anything, I would not, for I have done no wrong. He also kept writing to the Canadian media, making cryptic claims that there was more to the story than everyone knew. Still, he never managed to convince anyone he was innocent. Willie was also a compulsive liar. He once told a cellmate that as a killer, he was bigger than the ones in the States, likely in reference to the likes of serial killers John Wayne Gacy or Ted Bundy. This might have been one time that he told the truth. 
A wild-eyed and aging Charles Manson is asked in an interview who he actually is. He goofs around a little, playing the madman he's expected to be, and whispers, nobody. He goes on, I'm nobody. I'm a tramp, a bum, a hobo. I'm a boxcar and a jug of wine and a straight razor if you get too close to me. Who was he? It's a good question. He became the embodiment of the American monster, a totemic ghoul representing the downfall of a decade that changed a country. He was a brutal winter that followed a summer of love. If you believe the hype, Manson was the evilest man in the world, the personification of a society gone wrong. He might have been bad, but if he was as evil and powerful as many people made him out to be is another question. The story of Manson has changed a lot over the years, especially since a guy named Tom O'Neill published an account of the Manson murders that took him 20 years to research. That book is called Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s, and our indefatigable researchers at the Infographic Show have read it. The Manson we all know from earlier books, especially Helter Skelter, the true story of the Manson murders, isn't quite the same guy after reading that. We won't go too much into Manson's upbringing, but we will say that the young Charles Manson didn't have the best start in life. He was bruised and broken from a young age. He was the fallout from the American dream, and crime became came second nature to him, the petty stuff, at least during his younger years. He might have been the scapegoat that was set up to be the man that pretty much ended the idealism of the 60s counterculture. After his crimes came to light, the curtain was drawn on the hippie era, and it was business as usual in the USA. The final credits rolled over the glare of Manson's deranged face. What's interesting when we talk about how he got caught is how he also got away numerous times with a lot of crime. O'Neill's book tells us something we didn't fully understand about Manson's life. That is, he was arrested many times, but for some reason that doesn't make much sense, the cops just kept letting him go. O'Neill suggests that the cops released Manson on many occasions because someone wanted him released. Maybe Manson was part of someone's bigger plans. We know for a fact that the CIA back in those days was working on mind control projects using LSD. We also know that Manson, the messiah, managed to get folks who followed him to commit some terrible crimes. The big question nowadays is did the CIA use Manson as one of the test subjects and did Manson employ the same mind control techniques on his family? By the time he was 32, he spent more than half his life in prison. Then in 1967, he violated his parole by leaving the state he was in and somehow got away with it. He ended up in San Francisco, where he became part of drug experiments at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. O'Neill cannot connect Manson with the CIA's own experiments, but let's just say the connection is plausible. In light of his story, we'll say that Manson was certainly a blip on the radar of the authorities. By the time he was arrested, that blip looked more like a coat of paint. It was around this time that he started his cult, the Manson Family. It was also around this time that 10050 Cielo Drive, a house in Benedict Canyon, LA, was frequented by the rich and famous, the starlets, the freaks, anyone wanting a good time under the influence of a cornucopia of drugs. That's where up-and-coming actress Sharon Tate lived with her husband, film director Roman Polanski. This is where Polanski made videos of her. Let's just say some of those shoots were highly unethical. That remained a secret for a long time. What exactly went down in that house prior to the murders remains partly a mystery, but we know what happened on August 9, 1969. That was the murder of five people. Under the orders of Manson, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Kasabian, and Patricia Krenwinkel went to the house. Polanski was away in Europe making a movie, but Tate, then eight and a half months pregnant, was at home. Also in the house were Jay Sebring, Abigail Folger, Wojciech Farkowski, and Stephen Parent. Watson later testified he, Manson, said for me to take the gun and knife and go up to where Terry Melcher used to live. He said to kill everybody in the house as gruesome as I could. I believe he'd said something about movie stars living there. Terry Melcher is another story. He was a music producer who'd come to know Manson through the Beach Boys star Dennis Wilson. Melcher had once expressed interest in Manson's music only to snub him later. Melcher later lied under oath about the full extent of his relationship with Manson. Let's just say that Manson didn't like him after that rebuff of his questionable talents. He's also thought he still lived at the house at the time of the murders, or at least that's one story. Manson might have known Melcher didn't live there anymore. What seems sure, if you believe O'Neill's compelling research, is that Melcher knew Manson a whole lot better than he made out in court. It seems Melcher had been in a relationship with one of the young female Manson family, and that Tex Watson knew the house very well. He'd been in there many times before the 
night of the murders, according to O'Neill. So, all these people, the hippie freaks and the stars who were somehow mixed up, Manson had stayed with Wilson for a while before he and his family moved to a place called Spawn Movie Ranch, an abandoned place no longer used to shoot movies. On the night of the murders, Watson climbed up a telephone pole and cut the phone line to the house. The women were waiting nearby. The first of the victims, 18-year-old parent, was the first to die. He approached Watson and asked what he was doing at his house, which ended with Parent being shot four times. Parent was only really at the house by accident. He wasn't part of this so-called scene. Watson then got to the house through a window and let the girls in through the door. Frakowski, who was asleep on the couch, was rudely awakened. Surprised, he asked Watson what he was doing in the house. Watson replied, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. One of the girls, Atkins, then got a towel and tied Frakowski's hands with it. Atkins, under Watson's order, went to see who else was in the house. She found Abigail Folger, a 25-year-old woman heir to a coffee business fortune, and she was the girlfriend of Frakowski. When Atkins walked into the bedroom, Folger was reading a book, this being a house where many people people came and went, Folger just looked up and smiled at Atkins. Atkins then walked down the hall and looked into another room. There she saw the pregnant Tate dressed only in her underwear, chatting with Sebring, a 35-year-old celebrity hairstylist. He'd once been the boyfriend of Tate, a young woman who just played her biggest film role in The 13 Chairs. Tate had been in good spirits, landing that role, about to have a child, and often being the center of attention of what she called the love house. She was also married to a man who often demeaned her. Atkins went back to the living room and told Watson what she'd seen. They both tied Frykowski again, this time with nylon rope. Atkins then walked back to the bedrooms with a knife in her hand and ordered everyone to go to the living room. She said to Tate and Sebring, don't say a word or you're dead. Once in the living room, now frightened out of their lives, they pleaded with the intruders and offered them cash. All three of them were shoved onto their fronts and placed next to the fireplace. Watson tied a rope around the necks of Sebring and Tate and tied the same piece of rope to a beam in the ceiling. Sebring pleaded again, this time telling the intruders that Tate was obviously pregnant and this was disgusting behavior. Watson shot him on the spot. The others screamed. The rope tightened around Tate's neck. Watson then knelt down and repeatedly stabbed Sebring. He told one of the girls to turn off the lights. Tate screamed, What are you going to do with us? Watson replied, You're all going to die. Frykowski managed to get out of his binds, but Atkins was soon on him, stabbing him numerous times all over his body. With blood everywhere, he tried to run out the door, but Atkins ran after him. Watson put two bullets into Frykowski and then broke the butt of the gun after hitting him over the head. Folger, still in her nightgown, managed to make a run for it. She got as far as the lawn when one of the girls, Krenwinkel, caught up with her. Krenwinkel drove the knife into her 28 times. By the time Watson arrived to do more damage, Folger just said, I give up. I'm already dead. Take me. Tate was now crying in the living room with Atkins standing next to her. Tate pleaded with him. It didn't work. She was also stabbed many times. Atkins used some of her blood to write pig on the wall. Manson had given orders earlier to leave a sign, something witchy. They all returned to the ranch and went to bed. Atkins later said, I could not think about anything. It was almost as if I had passed out, blacked out. My head was blank. There was nothing in me. When the media found out about the murders, they called it an orgy of violence. The LA Times wrote ritualistic slayings. This caused widespread panic especially in an era where more conservative folks believed these freaks with long hair were destroying the fabric of society. Some reports even said Sebring had been wearing a black hood, a Satanist's hood. Then there was Polanski, a man who made the horror movie about Satanists called Rosemary's Baby. Some said Polanski himself was an occultist. There were rumors that he'd been at a party in London and said, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, who will be the next to go? Then the phone rang and he was told about the slayings. That never really happened. Even with all the hysteria, Manson wasn't content with the panic. The next night, he and six of the family went out hunting in an old Ford. They drove for three hours and then pulled up outside a house, 3301 Waverly Drive. They had no idea who lived there. Manson ordered Watson and Krenwinkel and a now new-to-be killer Leslie Lulu Van Houten to do the killing. Manson had just snooped around the house and when he got back to the car, he told them what to do. Inside the house was the supermarket executive Leno Libyanka and his wife Rosemary. Both were stabbed by Watson with a bayonet and Leno was stabbed by the girls with a knife. The word war was carved into her belly. Watson took a shower and the girls used blood to write rise and death to pigs on the walls. Krenwinkel also adopted the words Hilter Skelter on the fridge. She meant to write Helter Skelter, the name of a Beatles song. She also planted a steak knife in the woman's neck. At that point, Manson and the others had already driven away, leaving the killers to make their own way home. 
As for Helter Skelter, in Britain, it's a swirling slide for kids. According to Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecutor and writer of the best-known Manson book Helter Skelter, the cult believed in a race war related to that name. They killed because they wanted the murders to be blamed on blacks, which would result in a race war, and they would hide out in the desert as it happened. When the war was over, they'd return and take power from the winners of the war, the blacks. This theory is as far out as the hippies he was talking about. Tom O'Neill doesn't believe a word of it. In fact, he said Bugliosi made a lot of it up and lied about a lot more. For that, Bugliosi threatened to sue O'Neill if he ever published the book. Manson himself denied there was ever a Helter Skelter focused plan. He once explained why the term was used, saying, It means confusion, literally. It doesn't mean any war with anyone. It doesn't mean that some people are going to kill other people. Helter Skelter is confusion. He also said, As far as lining up someone for some kind of Helter Skelter trip, you know, that's the district attorney's motive. That's the only thing he could find a motive for to throw on top of all the confusion he had. There was no such thing in my mind as Helter Skelter. Let's remember here that Manson didn't actually kill anyone, so there had to be a conspiracy. The press went along with it. Manson might not have been a serial killer, he was portrayed as something even worse. It was said the Manson family were bloodthirsty robots controlled by an evil Pied Piper who followed Manson with blind obedience. They belonged to a hippie drug and murder cult. They were the result of children taking drugs, growing their hair long, and complaining about war and corruption, and talking too much about freedom. They were what happens when you don't do what you're told. That's why many people think the CIA might have had a hand in creating this kind of chaos. Ok, so back to the main story. At first, the LAPD said there was no connection between the Tate and LaBianca homicides, although they couldn't ignore the similarities and some connection with what they called the singing group The Beatles. According to Bugliosi's account, the Manson family had left the Spawn Ranch to go searching for the place in the desert where they would lay low while whites and blacks fought each other in the race war. It's true that Manson and some of his followers had relocated to Death Valley. That's where they were later picked up by the cops, not for murder but for car theft. The officers involved had no idea who they had on their hands. Meanwhile, cops in LA spoke to bikers who talked about how the family was linked to the murders. Also, a friend of Atkins had told cops that she'd been involved in the murders. She also was wanted in connection with another murder. The victim was Gary Hinman, and he'd been killed prior to the other killings. The reason was apparently Manson believed he owed money to the family. In this case, Manson had done some of the dirty work, slashing Hinman and cutting some of his ear off. Still, Hinman was killed by another member of the family. The word political piggy was written on the wall, although this wasn't a politically motivated crime. Years later, it was said the killing was simply over drugs or drug money. The political thing could have been a ruse because the family wanted the blame to fall on the Black Panthers, an African-American political organization. Atkins admitted to police she'd been involved in that murder. While in a detention center, she then told the inmates that the family was behind the other murders. Now cops went after the family. They got warrants and arrested Watson and some of the other women. Remember, Manson and the others were already in detention for the car theft thing. Now they had most of them rounded up, they used fingerprint evidence to connect some dots, and police also found the gun used to shoot parents, but they didn't find the knives. They did, however, find bloodied clothes ditched after the Tate murders. The trial was a media fest if there ever was one. The girls acted the part, laughing and smiling and generally looking like crazed hippies. No doubt they were crazed hippies, but they might not have been as demonic as was made out. They were young and stupid if anything, and also heartless, brutal killers. A member named Linda Kasabian who hadn't killed anyone had been a lookout on one of the nights. She might have also stopped another set of murders from happening. It helped the prosecution greatly that she testified against the others. Charles Manson was eventually convicted on seven counts of first-degree murder for the Tate LaBianca crimes. Manson as well as Watson, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Van Houten were handed the death penalty, but those were commuted to life sentences after the abolishment of the death penalty in California. People said that was the end of the 60s era. Idealism was dead. It is Manson only, really, who has gone down in history. The girls might also have been his victims was the rationale given by some people. Manson was the male puppet master, even if Watson had done much of the slaying. Atkins died in prison in 2009, Krenwinkel, now 73, is still in prison, 72-year-old Van Houten is also still in prison right now, as is 75-year-old Tex Watson. Manson died in prison in 2017. He didn't rant a lot during the years of his incarceration, coming off for some people as the nobody he once admitted to being. To others, he was the fiend of all fiends. Why did they really do what they did? It's doubtful the race war was anything to do with it. Manson might have been the leader, but if he had some big grand plan that only a demigod could implement, it's perhaps a bit overblown. He was an angry man with an influence over impressionable lost folks. Like many maniacs, he also tried to justify the unjustifiable. He once said, these children that come at you with knives, they are your children. You taught 
taught them. I didn't teach them, I just tried to help them stand up. Most of the people at the ranch that you call the family were just people that you did not want. As for if the CIA had anything to do with the Manson family, well, that will always remain top secret, but so-called spooks could well have lived in the shadows. A young woman walks down an alleyway on her way home from college, illuminated only in small puddles of light by the lamps above her. Little does she know that a man will be waiting for her as she emerges into the car park. Poor soul, she thinks after seeing that well-dressed man is struggling to carry books to his Volkswagen Beetle, especially as one of his arms is in a sling. She walks over to him and offers assistance, to which the polite and softly spoken man gives her his utmost thanks. As she takes some of the books and leans down to place them in the passenger seat, he hits her over the head with a tire iron. He gets into the driver's seat and leaves the scene. He'll strangle her like he did many others. He'll do unspeakable things to her. He is the quintessential maniac. His name is Ted Bundy. The scene we've just described to you was the modus operandi of this particular serial killer. Well, when he had planned his murders. Bundy's thing was to use his good looks, his speaking skills, and his educated demeanor to lure people into his trap. At times, he'd put his arm in a sling or even walk on crutches to give his victims a false sense of security. How harmful could a man be on crutches, one dressed in a suit, driving a cute car? This is why he was so hard to catch. He just didn't fit the profile of a serial killer, one who did absolutely disgusting things to people at the moment they died and after they died. He probably should have been caught much earlier than he was. After all, when young women went out and never came back, on a few occasions witnesses came forward and said they had seen a man lurking around, a man with one arm in a sling, a man that drove a VW Buck. 22-year-old Brenda Carol Ball was last seen talking to a guy in a car park who had brown hair and an arm in a sling. Soon after, Susan Elaine Rancourt went missing, never to return. Two people came forward after that and said they'd been approached by a man who wore a sling. He'd asked them for help putting some books into his car, a VW Beetle. Then, on June 11, 1974, University of Washington student Georgianne Hawkins went missing. Her body would never be found. We know that she'd been with her boyfriend and she left him after midnight. On her walk home to her sorority house, she was spotted by a male friend who was driving a car. He shouted out of the window, hey George, what's happening? She chatted with him for a minute or two and expressed that she was a bit nervous about her upcoming Spanish exam. Later, witnesses told the cops that they'd seen some guy skulking around in an alleyway close to Hawkins's, a guy whose arm was in a sling. One woman said he'd asked her to help him load a briefcase into a light brown Volkswagen Beetle. Little did she know at the time how close she was to being murdered. Hawkins wasn't so lucky. She fell for the trick, as any helpful person might. We know what happened to her because Bundy later talked about it. When she was close enough to his car, he hit her over the head with a crowbar, which knocked her clean out. When she came around, she was obviously confused, although to Bundy's surprise, she seemed to think that he'd turned up to help her with Spanish. She was evidently in shock. This is what Bundy said about that. It's odd the kinds of things people will say under those circumstances. He strangled her and dumped her body, a body he would return to on at least three occasions. You can only imagine how demented he was returning to a body that was decomposing. He had his reasons, but we'll get to that. Bundy was brazen, there's no doubt about it. He didn't ever think he'd be caught. He thought he was too intelligent for the police. After all, he'd worked in politics. He worked as an assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee, where he wrote a paper on rape prevention. He did a stint at the Department of Emergency Services, where he talked about missing women and how to find them. And that's likely why Bundy didn't have any qualms about returning to the alleyway from where he'd picked up Hawkins. The day after the abduction, he was there at the same time as the police, hiding in plain sight as he picked up one of the girl's shoes and her necklace. If he wasn't picking up girls in a car park or close by one, he was sneaking into basements while they slept and then bludgeoning the victim with some kind of iron bar. Bundy was like the boogeyman, a serial killer that crawled through windows and viciously attacked people while they were at their most vulnerable. But he was also a con artist. He played confidence tricks and he was very good at it. Investigators knew that when girls went missing, at times a man was seen with an arm in a sling, a man that owned a VW Beetle. Surely Bundy was easy prey after that. How many VW Beetles were there in those areas when the abduction happened? Areas dotted around the Pacific Northwest. The reality was Bundy's reign of terror was only in the early stages. The public and police were worried, that's for sure. Young folks stopped hitching rides and many became fearful of talking to strangers or leaving their windows open at night. Those with most to fear were young white women. Bundy's victims were almost always in their late teens or early 20s. They were Caucasian and most of them were attractive. They studied at university and were said to be intelligent and gifted students. 
Another thing was the fact that each girl disappeared at a college where construction work was going on. Could the disappearances be linked, wondered investigators? They just didn't know. They had very little forensic evidence to work with, and there were no bodies. That didn't mean the cops thought the girls had just taken off someplace. Nothing about their personalities and state of mind suggested that. Only weeks after Hawkins went missing, two women were abducted in broad daylight at Lake Sammamish State Park, not far from the city of Seattle. Bundy had first approached five women in the park, and in what they later described as a Canadian or British accent, the man introduced himself as Ted. Ted, dressed in a pressed white tennis outfit with one arm in a sling, politely asked them if they could help him unload a sailboat from his bronze-colored Volkswagen Beetle. Four of them said no, but one followed him to his car. Thankfully, she ran away when she became aware that there was no sailboat. That day, Bundy managed to enlist one woman for help, and he later abducted another close to a restroom. Both would die. Did he kill one in front of the other? He once said that that was true, but close to his execution date, he recanted that terribly bleak detail. This is not a story about his crimes, though. What we want to know is how the hell did the police not get closer to Bundy, seeing as he was using the same car and the same sling trick and so the same modus operandi? He even told the girls that escaped that he was named Ted. What more did the cops need? A written confession? They were closer, but still a long way from getting him. They at least now had good description of this Ted guy, and it did quite look like him. In no time at all, this sketch appeared in many newspapers and was shown on TV. Remember that we said Bundy worked at the Department of Emergency Services? Well, one of his co-workers there saw the sketch and heard about the Volkswagen Beetle, and she knew she was looking at her colleague, Mr. Bundy. She made a call to the cops, as did another person that knew Ted Bundy. The cops at the time were receiving something like 200 of these calls in one day, and they quickly assumed that a clean-cut law student with no criminal record couldn't be behind the abductions. Serial killers didn't look like that, or so they thought. The heat was on, though, and Bundy knew it. A couple of months after his last murder, bones were being found. Those bones were the remains of his victims, scattered in various places where the cops hadn't thought to look. It was fortunate for Bundy then that he was accepted to study at the University of Utah Law School. He packed his bags and headed south in August of 74. He was only in Utah a month when he started killing again. September 2nd, a hitchhiker. October 2nd, a 16-year-old girl. October 18th, a 17-year-old girl from a pizza parlor. It turned out that she was the daughter of a police chief. After her decomposing body was found on a hiking trail, the post-mortem exam revealed that Bundy had kept her alive for perhaps seven days. Each had been subjected to the most brutal depravity, although Bundy admitted years later that after he killed them, he shampooed their hair and applied makeup to their faces, keeping them in a state that he liked. He wanted the physical possession of the remains, and he wanted to do what he wanted to them. He sometimes chopped them, sometimes kept heads in his apartment, and he dressed them in the way he wanted them to look. And then he took a photograph. When you work hard to do something right, he once said, you don't want to forget it. More abductions happened, more murders, as well as attempted abductions. The disappearances were reported in the media, and after reading about them, a woman named Elizabeth Klepfer who dated Bundy back when he was in Washington put two and two together. She not only called the King County cops and told them that she thought she had been dating the killer, but she also told the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and said the same. She was still talking to Bundy at this point on the telephone, but she didn't say anything about her calls. For her, the sketch looked like Ted Bundy. The car was Bundy's, and so the murders following him around were just too much of a coincidence. Bundy started then killing in Colorado. Things didn't change much. Death by blunt force trauma, sometimes strangulation, bodies dumped, mutilated, sometimes wearing clothes that weren't theirs. 1975 drew to an end and there were more victims, some whose bodies have never been found. 76 turned out to be another bloody year, so how come Washington cops weren't at the very least looking at Bundy? They only did that after they discovered a new toy, a computer, and a database. They found that they could input data about the murders and the computer would compare that data to data already in the system. Thousands of names were in that database, but only 26 names matched the crimes. Bundy's was one of them. The problem was connecting the Utah and Colorado murders to the Pacific Northwest murders. At the time, there were no large databases containing all the state's police departments. The fact of the matter was, while the cops should have known better after the tip-offs, because Bundy moved around, he managed to evade capture. But then, he was pulled over by a cop in a Salt Lake City suburb after he'd been driving around looking suspicious. On searching Bundy's car, the cop found quite the collection of suspicious items. A ski mask, trash bags, handcuffs, a crowbar lengths of rope, and an ice pick. All that was pretty much the consummate serial killer stash. 
It didn't take long for the cops to understand that they might have a maniac on their hands, and they had the phone call from Bundy's lover in their records, and they had his car description from one of the abductions. Still, after searching his house, the police didn't have enough to keep him. One thing they didn't find that day was a bunch of photographs of his dead victims. Things would have been very different had they discovered those awful snaps. Bundy was on the loose again, but he was being monitored all day long. Some of the cops flew to Seattle to speak to Bundy's lover. She told them that some things just didn't add up such as why did he keep crutches in his house, and what about that plaster of Paris, not to mention the surgical gloves, big knives, meat cleaver, and a bag full of women's clothes. Bundy was certainly in a fix now, but he was by no means done. He sold his beloved beetle, but that was soon sequestered by investigators who gave the interior a good going over. What they found were strands of hair from females, and those females were very likely victims of murder. Police brought Bundy in and put him in a lineup but they only had enough evidence to possibly put him on trial for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. His parents paid his $15,000 bail and off he went, once again, a free man, but under heavy round-the-clock surveillance. He actually lived with his lover again while he was on bail, which should have been a very strange time for her. At this point, the lead investigators from Utah, Washington, and Colorado all finally got together and shared their stories and what evidence they had. They were pretty darn sure that they had a serial killer on their hands, and an utterly depraved one at that. Before they could get him for murder, though, he faced trial for kidnapping and assault. He was found guilty and sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. While in there, he was charged with just one of the murders. Bundy was a desperate man around this time, likely knowing that his crimes or most of them would catch up with him and he'd be looking at the death penalty. He chose to defend himself, and because of that he didn't have to wear handcuffs or leg shackles in court. On one of those court appearances, he managed to convince the court he needed the library and he leapt from a window. He actually survived for six days around the wilderness of the Aspen Mountains, but was eventually picked up by the cops. The case against him for that one murder was actually quite weak, but it seemed that Bundy believed they would get him. If he was done for that case, more cases might follow. Over a period of six months, he got his hands on a floor plan of the jail. He saved money after getting it smuggled in by visitors, and he also got himself a hacksaw. On December 30, 1977, Bundy filled his bed with books, so it might look like he was sleeping. He then got through the ceiling and into an apartment. There, he changed into civilian clothes and then he walked out of the jail. He went from Chicago to Atlanta to Florida in stolen cars, only stopping to steal certain items or wallets from people. On January 15, 1978, he walked around at night in Florida State University. In the early hours of the morning, he assaulted, bludgeoned, strangled, and bit three sleeping women in three different rooms, all within about 15 minutes. Two of them survived but were very badly injured. He left the sorority house and went to an apartment building where he viciously attacked another girl, fracturing her skull and jaw. There he left behind one of his favorite things, his pantyhose mask. Police also found sperm and hair samples. Bundy later drove to Jacksonville where he abducted and killed a 12-year-old girl. A few days later, he was stopped by a police officer. During questioning, he kicked the man's legs and ran for it. The cop fired warning shots, but Bundy kept running. He was too slow, he was tackled, and in spite of his best efforts, he couldn't get the gun from the cop. Bundy was done for, sat in a car, handcuffed, on his way to certain death. Still, this Florida policeman didn't know who he had in the car. He was not aware that he was carrying one of the USA's most wanted fugitives. He certainly had no idea that the occupant of his vehicle would become known as one of the worst, most vile serial killers of all time, a demon whose warped brutality knew no bounds. And do you know what Bundy said to the cop while he was in the car? He said, I wish you had killed me. Eventually, he confessed to 30 murders, but there could have been many more. On January 24, 1989, age 42, Bundy took his final breaths in the electric chair. His last words were, I'd like you to give my love to my family and friends. Today's new entry into the serial killer hall of infamy might just be the worst Russian serial killer of modern times, although you could argue that Andrei Chikatilo, aka the Rostov Ripper, takes that spot due to the utterly brutal nature of his crimes. While we've mostly concentrated on American serial killers, you could say we are trying to branch out, having now featured a Japanese child killer, the blight of Victorian London Jack the Ripper, and the globe-trotting conman and backpacker killer from France, Charles Sobrage. The man today is slightly different in that he didn't really choose a certain kind of victim. Anyone would do, it seems. He did once say, for me, life without murder is like life without food for you. So it's understandable that he wasn't picky. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, Alexander Pachushkin, the Chessboard Killer. 
The first thing we did when researching this show was to watch a clip of Pichushkin being interviewed, which you can find on YouTube in Russian with no subtitles. He's certainly a strange looking man, with a kind of oversized head, sunken eyes, and he doesn't seem to like making eye contact. Unlike many of the serial killers we featured, he didn't do too many interviews, neither did he make money from books or have movies made about him. Nope, this sad looking guy just went to jail and that's where he remains today. He was sentenced to life in 2007, with the first 15 years of his sentence to be served in solitary confinement. He's held at an unknown jail where it's said his only visitor is his mother. Russian authorities don't want him anywhere near other people. He even appeared in court in a cage. You might wonder what he did to be given this kind of special treatment, so here we go. First, a quick bio. Petrushkin was born on April 9, 1974. As an adult, he went on a killing rampage, with the victims numbering somewhere between 49 and 60. He's called the Chessboard Killer, we'll tell you later why, and also the Bitsa Park Maniac, because that park is where he did his handiwork. And let us tell you, this is one strange killer, someone that no doubt had a modus operandi unlike anyone in history, and it's not likely anyone will ever copy him. But let's now go back to his childhood. He was born in the industrial city of Maitishi, which lies northeast of Russia's capital, Moscow, only a short drive away. Many people who live in this grim city call it Zhopa Mira, which translates as butthole of the world. His childhood is very important when discussing this man, because it's said that an event that happened when he was just a young kid may have been the reason he turned into such an animal. At four years old, little Alex fell off a swing backwards. If that wasn't bad enough, the swing struck him in the head on its way back down. This caused severe damage to his frontal cortex, and that's the reason his forehead is a bit misshaped today. But worse than the cosmetic aberration was what it did to his brain. When you badly injure this part of the brain, it can result in not being able to control impulses and aggression. This happens to a lot of sports people who've incurred such brain injuries. But for the poor, once sociable Petrushkin, life got very tough. Not only did he have learning disabilities, but he was bullied in school because of the way he looked. He would often become violent with these kids, making sure they knew that calling him retarded would result in dire consequences. His mother then took him out of mainstream school and entered him in a school for special needs children. The Guardian interviewed a childhood neighbor of Petrushkin. Her name was Svetlana Mordiakova, and she told the newspaper that he was always polite and pleasant, and that he had a great fondness for animals, especially dogs. It's said he was devastated when his cat died. We also know that in spite of having some learning difficulties, he was very good at playing chess. It was Petrushkin's grandfather that noticed and admired these abilities, and he believed special school taught him nothing, so it was best the boy go live with him where he could hone his chess skills. It said he became outstanding at the game, and it was through this that he vented all of that emotional energy he was carrying around. Unfortunately, the grandfather died. It said this was the turning point for Petrushkin, whose rage would once again come to the fore. Some analysts said it was the terrible grief he felt at losing the one man that had seen his talent and loved him dearly that sent him over the edge. Nope, the boy didn't stay gentle for long. Police now know that when Petrushkin was just 18, he committed his first murder. The victim was a boy that lived close by, and he was killed because Petrushkin was in love with his girlfriend. The girl he ostensibly loved five years later was found dead in the infamous park, and police believe that was also the work of Petrushkin. But let's not get carried away. So we have a chess champion who had just lost the closest person in his life. It didn't stop him playing chess, but it did start his drinking campaign. Apparently, the young man would hang out in Bitsa Park, swigging neat vodka and looking for opponents to play chess with. It seems there were plenty of people that wanted to play, but reports state Petrushkin's game was never affected by the hooch. Prior to his first murder, when he was about 16, it said he would take a video camera to the park and shoot children playing. It's also said that one time, he picked up a small boy by the leg at the apartment block where he lived, held him upside down, and uttered the ominous words, You are in my power now. I'm going to drop you from the window, and you will fall 15 meters to your death. This was apparently later found in some footage he had taken. Anyhow, the teenager was depressed, we are told, and would spend days in the park walking his beloved dog, drinking and smoking. Then, the dog died too. Psychologist Mikhail Vinogradov has said that the death of his grandfather became an abandonment issue. Add the dog to that, and it seems as if he lost everyone he loved. So, this is where the killing starts. As he is one of the most prolific killers of all time, we can't go into all the murders, of course, but we will say many of his victims, most in fact, were old men. But he did kill some children, young folks, and middle-aged people, and on three occasions, he chose women. One of those women was found with stakes nailed into her skull and close to her eyes. Yes, he was quite sadistic, and some theorize he got a sexual buzz out of it. He did once admit that killing gave him a perpetual orgasm. 
He said murdering people made him feel like a god. Sometimes he'd just invite folks to drink with him, even go sit where he had buried his dog, and then when their back was turned, he'd smash in their skull with a hammer. He also killed a few people by throwing them down into a sewer. Not the best way, and it's believed some people survived this. As we just said, sometimes he would do bad things to the bodies, but he made little attempt to hide them at times, especially near the end of his spree. Other people were thrown down those sewage wells after being killed. We might also remember that it was easy to kill in this park and hide bodies, as it is more than four times the size of New York Central Park. In all cases, I killed for only one reason. I killed in order to live. Because when you kill, you want to live, he once told the press, adding, I felt like the father of all these people, since it was me who opened the door for them to another world. As for the strange MO we mentioned at the start of the show, he had a habit of inserting a bottle of vodka, neck first of course, into the holes he had bashed in his victims' heads. He wedged them in well, too. And that's how police found the bodies. This became big news, and especially as so many bodies were turning up. Locals talked of an animal that stalks at night, a monster that hides in the park. At the same time, Petrushkin was working in a grocery store, and it's said he was always very amiable. He actually once talked in court about how he liked to be friendly, even to the people he killed. Prior to slaughtering them, he said he'd get intimate, have fun, be open and friendly. He said, the closer a person is to you and the better you know them, the more pleasurable it is to kill them. It's said 10 of his victims lived in the same apartment block, so why wouldn't they go for a stroll in the park with a young man? Many were friends, former schoolmates, or acquaintances. GQ writes that making new friends was his hobby, saying one of his favorite books was How to Win Friends and Influence People. He even gave some of the victims their final wish. He asked one such victim what he would want if he could have anything in the world. The man said, I wish I could stop drinking. Petrushkin's reply to that was, I promise you, today will be the day you stop drinking. He also said that he wanted to beat the body count of killer and fellow Russian Andrei Chikatilo and have a body for every square on a chessboard. He didn't quite make 64 squares, but he got very close. Even so, when interviewed, he said even if he had reached that target, he would have carried on killing. One report says police found his diaries describing the murders and found a chessboard. On it, 61 squares from the 64 were marked according to his body count. He was caught though, and that was because inside of the pocket of one of his victims, 36-year-old co-worker Marina Moskalyova, was a train ticket stub. Police then looked at closed-circuit television footage of the station where she had been, and who was with her? None other than the 32-year-old Alexander Pichushkin. Police knew they had their man, as the woman, suspicious at being invited to the park to see Petrushkin's dog grave, had told her boyfriend who she was with and gave him Petrushkin's phone number. We might add that some critics say it took police so long to catch this man, who sometimes just left bodies in the open, replete with vodka bottle and head adornment, was because the victims were mainly poor and so not important in the eyes of authorities. Reports describe the squalor of the Russian-style projects where these people live as the back end of the country. During his court appearance, as you know, he was caged in glass. He was convicted of 49 murders and 3 attempted murders, but that wasn't to Petrushkin's liking. He asked to be convicted of 11 more murders, bringing his tally to 60. Chikatilo, his serial killing opponent, had been convicted in 1992 of 53 murders. In terms of what's on the official scorecard, Petrushkin did not come out victorious. For the killer, his moment of fame was important. Andre Supruneko, who was the lead investigator in the case, once said, All maniacs want to talk. It made him feel important. I told him I admired him, and he liked that, and then he opened up. It was very important for Petrushkin that people think he was a hero, so I made him feel like a hero. Following our show on the infamous serial killer known as Jack the Ripper, we thought we'd look at another equally fascinating crime story, that of the Zodiac Killer, that has baffled both investigators and the public alike. These two beasts were not the only prolific killers never to be caught, but perhaps the most well-known. Other serial killers that got away with it include the Atlanta Ripper, India's Stone Man, the Axeman of New Orleans, and one person that had the terrifying name of The Babysitter. There are plenty more, but maybe none who led police on such a confounding wild goose chase as the person we are going to discuss today. So wrap your heads around this episode of the Infographic Show, The Zodiac Serial Killer. How did he evade the police? I like killing people because it's so much fun. These were the chilling words written in a letter by someone we know as the Zodiac Killer. But where did the killing begin? Well, the Zodiac, a name he gave to himself in the letters he sent to police, claimed to have killed 37 people in total, but that may not be the case. Police are pretty sure he killed at least 5 people and injured 2 others, but they also say there is a possibility he was responsible for another 20 to 28 murders. The earliest confirmed murder didn't take place until 1968, but it's widely believed that the Zodiac was working much earlier than that. 
The first confirmed murders were those of a young couple, Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, killed on December 20th, 1968. The couple pulled into a place named Lover's Lane, probably about to reach first base on what was said to be their first date. They didn't get too far because a man approached their vehicle and shot the man in the head. The girl ran, but was shot five times in the back. A few months later, the Zodiac would claim these murders as his own, and he would share details only the killer could have known. You can go back much earlier though, to 1963, and again, this terrorizer of the night picked on young people. High school lovers Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards used Senior Ditch Day to go for a sunbathe at Gaviota State Park in California. They never made it home. The boy's dad found the bodies after becoming worried about his son being out for a long time. When he went to the beach to look for them, he found both his son and the girlfriend tied up. The boy had been shot 11 times and the girl 9 times. This may or may not have been our man. Did the Zodiac kill 18-year-old Sherry Josephine Bates? Brutally stabbed several times and her throat slashed so hard it almost decapitated her? That was in 1966 and it was some years later that police thought this too could have been the work of the Zodiac. Police are sure the Zodiac almost killed 19-year-old Michael Magoo and did kill his 22-year-old girlfriend Darlene Farron. Both were shot in 1969 while sitting in their car at Blue Rock Springs Park in Vallejo. The killer later called the police and described exactly what had happened. He finished the chilling call saying, I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. He was referring to Jensen and Faraday. Perhaps the grisliest confirmed crime was that of two lovers, 20-year-old Brian Hartnell and 22-year-old Cecilia Ann Shepard. The pair were relaxing at a lake in Napa County, California when a man in a hooded costume with the Zodiac emblem sewed on it told them he was a prison escapee. He bound them with clothesline while they were on their backs. He then stabbed the boy six times in the back, turned to the screaming girl and stabbed her ten times. Hartnell actually survived. The killer then went up to the couple's car and scrawled in pen some information about the other murders. Hartnell unfortunately wasn't able to give police much information about the man that almost took his life. The last confirmation, and perhaps the closest the Zodiac came to being caught, was when he shot 28-year-old Paul Stein in the back of his head from his taxi cab in San Francisco. He only just got away as police approached the scene, but for some reason the cops were looking for a black suspect. The cops thought it was a robbery until shortly after the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter signed from the Zodiac. The letter stated, I am the murderer of the taxi driver. And just to be sure the police believed him, also inside the letter was a piece of the bloodstained shirt that Stein had been wearing on the night. People did see a man near the cab that night though, and now police thought they had some idea concerning what he looked like. The Zodiac said that was a bad version of him, stating in a letter that the night of the murder he was wearing a disguise. There were many more suspected murders, but we can't go through them all. Let's talk about these letters instead, most of which were written with terrible handwriting. The first letter sent in 1966 was titled, The Confession. He gets straight to the point, starting with the lines, She was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first and she will not be the last. Still, it's thought this could have been any delusional person, perhaps not the actual Zodiac killer. Many more letters are suspected to have come from the Zodiac, but others have been confirmed. On July 31st, it's thought the Zodiac sent a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, San Francisco Examiner, and Vallejo Times. Each newspaper had been sent one part of something called a cipher. This may also be called a cryptogram and is a coded way of sending a message. In this case, it was a block of letters and symbols. The Zodiac was some trickster. While he later wrote a letter saying the cipher contained his name, it was actually later discovered to have said, I will not give you my name. He sent a series of letters, sometimes with ciphers. The first cipher when worked out contained a message, part of which read, The best part of it is that when I die I will be reborn in paradise and all those that I have killed will become my slaves. He even wrote to Chronicle reporter Paul Avery, who had been working on the case. It was a Halloween card that contained the text, Peekaboo, you are doomed. This was a threat, a matter that became serious for Avery. Despite what the Zodiac movie tells us, it was later said by Avery's friends and colleagues that the case didn't drive him to drugs and drink and his eventual death. That part is fiction, said the people. The last letter received was on January 29, 1974. In this letter, the Zodiac wrote that the film The Exorcist was a great satirical comedy. He left a symbol that has never been explained, and like that, he was gone. So, why was he never caught? Well, firstly, some people do think the police had their man, they just didn't have the sufficient evidence to get a conviction. The prime suspect has always been Arthur Lee Allen, and he's the only one that police gained search warrants for. Several police officers have said they thought it was him. 
Robert Graysmith, the cartoonist at the San Francisco Chronicle who was very close to the case at the time of the murders, wrote a book called Zodiac, and in it, he puts Allen as the main culprit. Police were all over him for almost 20 years, and in the end, had a lot of leads. Bloody knives in his car, matching footprints at the murder scene, a knowledge of ciphers, a positive ID from a survivor, being seen close to one killing, other people saying he had bragged about killing and had talked about naming himself Zodiac, he even had a history of abusing children and an apparent hatred for women, although police said they just could not find enough evidence to convict him. So perhaps it's as simple as that. Cops had their man, but he slipped through their hands. His handwriting didn't match, and neither did his DNA on the envelopes of the Zodiac letters. Allen was found dead in 1992 at his home. Was it Richard Gaykowski, a good fit for the sketch, mentally unstable, and most of all linked to the ciphers that were sent? Still, the man's friends have given him solid alibis for some of the murders. Was it Earl Van Best Jr., an absolute dead ringer for the Zodiac sketch, and his name seems to appear in the ciphers? Some people have said it might have been the Unabomber, aka Theodore J. Kaczynski, but given his intellect, modus operandi, and of course his twisted but profound reason for killing, it just wouldn't make sense. One connection we suppose is that they both wrote to newspapers to spread the news of their wicked game. Was it Ricky Marshall, who owned a typewriter and liked the same movies as the Zodiac? That's hardly a strong case. Was it mentally ill Lawrence Kane, who knew coding, whose name may have been in the ciphers, and who was actually a colleague of one of the victims? What about Ross Sullivan, another mentally ill man that was close to the location of the murders and a good fit for the sketch? And guess what? The Zodiac once mentioned the opera The Mikado, written by none other than Gilbert and Sullivan. The list goes on, but these guys have all been discussed widely by people that have followed the case professionally, and also all those online sleuths we have these days. There are plenty of Zodiologists out there, and many have differing opinions. Why was he never caught? Many hypotheses have been put forward, from bad police work, different police departments working on the case and not communicating well, to good old plain luck on the killer side, to the fact the killer was likely not related in any way to any of the victims. They usually are, even if it means they regularly catch the same bus. He chose his locations carefully, for the most part, which were often totally remote and far from each other. We might also add that back in the 60s and 70s, the forensic technology was primitive compared to now. These days, it's likely his murders would not have only been on CCTV, but they'd be going viral after being posted on something like LiveLeak. Even the lead investigator on the Zodiac case doesn't know why they didn't catch him in the end. His name was Dave Tashi, and we'll leave you with something he said. Why didn't we get this guy? I ended up with a bleeding ulcer over this case. It still haunts me, it always will. He's dead now. Rest in peace, Dave. Okay, so first let's get one thing straight. Count Dracula wasn't a real person. He was the creation of writer Bram Stoker in his 1897 novel Dracula. But Stoker didn't pull Dracula out of thin air. The myth of the vampire had been circulating around mostly Eastern Europe for centuries, sometimes leading to accusations of vampirism in the public, and a few brave but perhaps demented people digging up corpses and plunging a stake into a stopped heart. There are reports of people doing this in Serbia in the early 1700s, but tales of soul-destroying, blood-sucking dudes with a fine set of shiny incisors are thought to have originated in antiquity. If you type Vampire Arrested into Google, you'll quickly see that the vampiric age is not dead. But today, we're going to focus on a real devil in this episode of the infographic show, Tsutomu Miyazaki, the human Dracula. Miyazaki is also sometimes referred to as the girl killer, which explains clearly how he entered the serial killer hall of infamy. You could say he's almost the Japanese version of Jeffrey Dahmer if you switch teenage boys for very young girls. Like Dahmer, Miyazaki had a thing for expressing a twisted adoration of dead bodies. This is our way of describing necrophilia without veering too much into the realm of X-rated content. He also ate parts of them for dinner. Yes, he was a cannibal, but how did this maniac transform from cute little Japanese boy to wretched killer of kids? Let's take a brief look at his past. If you've seen our other serial killer shows, you can bet he didn't have the best start in life. His raw and luck started the moment he took his first breath, but if you want to be more precise, it started while he was still in the womb. He was born on August 21st, 1962, which makes him a Leo. We actually looked up famous serial killers and their star signs, and Gemini had the most. So if you are a Gemini, you are in some bad company. Okay, sorry about the digression. So, this guy was born with very deformed hands. Not only was it hard for him to use them, but they looked like the hands of Nosferatu. Long and thin and gnarled and utterly creepy looking. As you might imagine, this didn't go down well with the girls, and it was an endless stream of amusement for young boys that liked to bully him. It said Miyazaki soon learned it was best to stay alone. That he did, while reading fantasy comics and watching slasher films. 
only he soon graduated from comics and horror movies to watching Japanese pornography. It was later discovered he had amassed over 5,763 of these Screamadelic videos, and as weird as they can be, it wasn't enough, and soon he was into anime and illegal films whose victims were children. He once said about normal Japanese pornography, they black out the most important part. They weren't good enough for him, and aside from searching for and finding illegal videos, he filmed girls' underwear when he managed to get shots while they were playing tennis at a nearby court. The thing is, this was a kid with opportunities. His dad owned a newspaper, but Miyazaki wasn't interested in taking it over. He was a black sheep as well as a lonely cripple. He watched videos all the time rather than work, and it said the two sisters that lived with him didn't like him at all. His dad never listened to him, and his mother wasn't exactly doting. The one person he did have was his grandfather, whom he loved so much, he ate part of his ashes after he died so he could stay with him forever. Things went downhill after the death of Grandpa. On one occasion, Miyazaki was caught spying on one of his sisters as she showered. She expressed her concern, and rather than apologize, he beat her up. His mother admonished him for Crime 1 and Crime 2, and so he beat her up too. You get the picture. This is one unhappy kid. As is the case with so many abused kids who attempt to gain power and control in their lives, he soon turned to murder. And so, on August 22nd, 1988, Miyazaki abducted a four-year-old from a park in Tokyo. He took her to a quiet spot under a bridge, and the two chatted for around 30 minutes. He then strangled her and proceeded to engage in sexual acts with her corpse. He stripped her and took home her clothes. Only a few days later, he had a change of mind and went back to the decomposing body. He chopped off her hands and feet, which would later be discovered in his closet. He took the rest of the body, burned it, and ground the bones into powder. He then sent some of this powder to the girl's parents, along with a few of her teeth and some photos of her clothes. He sent a postcard too, which cryptically read, Mary, cremated, bones, investigate, prove. Soon after, he did the same with a seven-year-old girl who had been walking around by herself. Again, he engaged in necrophilia, and he did that at the exact same spot where he had done it before. He kept the clothes again, presumably for later gratification. He took his third victim, another four-year-old, just a couple of months after. He drove her to the prefecture of Saitima, to a parking lot, and took photos of her while she was alive. He dumped her body there and left her clothes close by in a green area. Again, he sent the parents a postcard, but this time he used letters cut out from magazines. The postcard cryptically read, Erica, cold, cough, throat, rest, death. It said that a passing driver saw the two together, and if he'd have done something, he could have stopped the murder, but he drove on, soon after the girl was strangled. It's also said that his car got stuck in a gutter where he had stopped and then taken the dead girl from the car. After he had dumped her, a bunch of guys helped him get his car out. Because of all the things that went wrong, he waited a while before he next struck. But about six months later, he took a wandering five-year-old girl from a park. He took her to his car, killed her, then covered her in a sheet and took her home with him. There he spent two days molesting the dead girl, and he took photos and videos of this. The videos were later found in his room. When decomposition made it impossible for him to further exploit her body, he chopped her up. He dumped the torso and head in separate locations and kept the hands. He admitted to eating part of these hands and drinking blood from her, but he got paranoid and soon dumped what was left of the hands. He got caught soon after this when he was attempting to insert a zoom lens of a camera inside a young girl's vagina, or according to another report, just in between her legs. He was trying this in a park, it said, but the girl's dad turned up, hit Miyazaki, and he ran off absolutely naked. The dad reported him, of course, and when cops went to Miyazaki's house to confront him, they found his stash of terrible homemade videos, as well as all the other sexual videos. Police also later found some girl's hands. It's said during his trial he showed no remorse whatsoever, and even once said that he had done a good job. He said he was a Japanese hero, and during the trial he thought he was on stage. He refused to apologize for what he had done, compelling some people to think he was insane. Court-appointed psychiatrists had two different opinions, one that he had a personality disorder but knew exactly what he was doing, and another that his mind was not working correctly during his reign of terror. In Japan, that's called having a feeble mind, and if the judge agreed with that, the sentence would be more lenient. But the judge believed the first diagnosis, and he was sentenced to death. Considering the cruelty of his crimes, their social impact, and the sentiments of the victim's kin, capital punishment is unavoidable, said the judge. This was in spite of Miyazaki saying he had felt as though he was dreaming when he committed the murders, and that he had been hallucinating about something he called the rat people. 
One psychiatrist said he may not have an incapacitating personality disorder, such as paranoia or schizophrenia, but I think he may be borderline. His rich father didn't offer any money to help with his son's defense, as he said it would have been an insult to the victim's families. In fact, in true Japanese style, the father took his own life a few years later after this huge loss of honor. It's said after his arrest, Miyazaki wrote a letter to his dad, blaming him for everything. To his mom, he simply wrote, Mother, I've caused you much heartache. Don't forget to change the oil in my car, or it will get so that you can't drive it. Before he was executed, he told more of his story, saying how being hated or just ignored by his parents and his sisters made his life miserable. It turned out he hurt animals, as many serial killers do before they turn their attention to human flesh. He strangled his pet dog to death and killed two cats, one of which he boiled to death. After some retrials relating to the man's sanity, his death sentence was upheld and Miyazaki was hanged on June 17, 2008. If you've read or watched interviews with serial killers, most of them either come across as slightly deranged or at least very creepy. But the focus of today's show, we must admit, seems kinda likable in the interviews. Watch the one in 1994 where Jeff tells all while sat next to his loving father. My childhood wasn't filled with any great tragedies, he told the interviewer, but then explained his predilection for dissecting dogs and cats as a kid. It could have led to a normal hobby like taxidermy, he added, but it didn't. And soft-spoken Jeff turned his efforts towards killing and taking apart human beings in an unimaginable fashion. I acted on my fantasies and that's where everything went wrong, he said. Today we'll see how wrong it went. In this episode of the Infographic Show, the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee Monster. If you've seen the recent movie about our killer, called My Friend Dahmer, you'll see he is portrayed as a bit of a loner in school with some strange habits. He has few friends, but he doesn't seem to have violent impulses. You'd probably not even notice him if you went to the same school. The movie was based on a graphic novel by the same name written by Durf Backdurf. He researched Dahmer, and this is what he had to say. There are a surprising number out there who view Jeffrey Dahmer as some kind of anti-hero a bullied kid who lashed back at the society that rejected him. This is nonsense. Dahmer was a twisted wretch whose depravity was almost beyond comprehension. So, how did this quiet boy become a twisted serial killer? Well, as you already know, Dahmer had a penchant for dissecting animals that he found on the road. After dissection, he would often dissolve the bodies in a barrel of chemicals. This was at his family home in Ohio. Dahmer has called this time of his life intense, stating that his mother was often frantic and his dad always busy. He got little attention at home, and this seems to have been a catalyst to his problems. Psychologists might say Jeff grew up with a dysphoric family, which kind of means a family mess. It's said at one point the young Dahmer had even tried to take his own life. He had a few buddies, and they would later tell the authorities, media, and book writers about how Jeff would find bugs and small animals and dissect them. Dahmer has admitted that he wanted to see how they fitted together. His dad said as a kid, his son fell in love with bones. He loved hearing the sound they made and spent much of his time looking for them. Yep, perhaps the busy father should have looked into this morbid fascination with dead bodies and their different parts. The writing was on the wall, but it said his dad, who was an analytical chemist, just thought Jeff had a curious mind, as all scientists should. But despite all his weirdness, he played tennis regularly and was in the school band for a while. He also turned up to school sometimes thinking of booze. He was a bit of a class clown, sometimes acting out seizures or pretending he had cerebral palsy. This became known as doing a Dahmer. This was when he was in his early teens. It's then that the real trouble started. Jeff realized that he was gay sometime around the age of 14. Due to the prevailing culture of the time, he had to keep that secret. He would sometimes watch a male jogger running down the road while he was hidden in the bushes. He fantasized about this guy, but he wasn't thinking about candlelit dinners and nights in front of the TV watching Happy Days. No, young Jeff jumped the shark, so to speak, and imagined somehow making this runner unconscious and then having sex with the lifeless body. He even once planned to actually go through with it, waiting in the bushes armed with a baseball bat, but the jogger didn't run that day. At age 17, with his parents still screaming at each other continually, his grades going downhill and his drinking getting worse, Dahmer was at the height of his unhappiness. He did graduate though, right at the time his parents divorced. It's right after graduation, a matter of a few weeks, that Dahmer graduated from dissecting animals to dissecting humans. At age 18, he picked up a guy, Stephen Mark Hicks, who was hitchhiking to a place called Lockwood Corners, Ohio, to see a concert. He was 18, the same age as Jeff, so it doesn't seem out of the ordinary that this young guy would agree to go back to Dahmer's pad and do some drinking. Only Jeff wasn't too happy when the guy called his own bell and said he should go. No, Jeff didn't like that at all. 
He knocked the kid out with a dumbbell and then finished him off by strangling him with the bar of the dumbbell. He then masturbated over the corpse. When that was done, he chopped up the body and put various parts in bags and buried them. Later, he would dig up the parts and slice the flesh from the bones. He then crushed those bones and scattered what was left in woodland like one would scatter the ashes of someone they loved. That was Jeff's first murder, and as we say, it's hard to believe the man in the interviews could sit in his house paring flesh from bones. From that date in 1978 until he was arrested in 1991, he would kill 17 people, so we can't detail every murder. What we will say is that Dahmer has few equals in the milieu of the total depravity. He didn't kill for a while as he enlisted in the army. That lasted from 1978 to 1981 as he was kicked out for his heavy drinking. At the time, the army didn't know, or chose not to believe, that Jeff was a rapist. He worked in the medic unit with a guy of similar age named Preston Davis. Davis believes Dahmer drugged him and raped him. He later told the press, I was raped by Jeffrey. I am just thankful to be alive to tell the story. He was replaced by a 17-year-old named Billy Joe Capshaw, who bunked with Dahmer. Capshaw later told the press that Dahmer tied him up and raped him several times. I was there for another 17 months with Jeff, being raped and tortured. Capshaw said he had even used a rape kit to prove it to his officers, but it seems the army didn't believe him. Once Dahmer is out of the army, what does he do next? During the years until his next murder, you could say he was still active regarding his devotion to being evil. He drugged young men and then had sex with their unconscious bodies. It's thought he did this around a dozen times. He also fantasized about digging up dead bodies and doing things to them. This of course was not convenient and so Jeff was about to start making his own dead bodies. He waited until 1987 and then killed and dismembered another young man while living with his grandmother. Again, he masturbated over the corpse. He took it a step further though. Dahmer always said that he didn't mean to kill the first of those victims at his grand's place and he just woke up with a bloody dead man in his bed. Nonetheless, he didn't exactly get on the phone to the cops and frantically explain that there had been a terrible accident. On the contrary, he chopped up the body, put the parts in a suitcase, and then boiled the flesh from the severed head in chemicals. When he had a shiny skull at the end of his cooking, he used that as a masturbation tool. After a while, he crushed that and scattered the bits. While staying with his grandmother, he killed again, employing a similar modus operandi of drugging, strangling, having some kind of intercourse with the corpse, dismembering the body, and keeping the skull after boiling. One lucky guy he brought home didn't get killed, only because his grand discovered that Jeff had company that evening. His grandmother quickly threw him out because he was a drunk and because he brought young men home late at night, and because for some reason, she smelled something foul emanating from Jeff's room. As you can imagine, when living in his own place, things got worse. He was actually arrested and later charged for drugging and sexually molesting a 13-year-old, and then arrested on a similar charge again, but prior to being sentenced, he killed again. This time he found a very handsome chap who was a male model. He met him in a gay bar, and even though Dahmer said he had not intended to kill that night, he felt he didn't have much choice as the model came and flirted with him. Again, after flaying the dead body and smashing up the bones, Dahmer got rid of what was left. Only this time, he kept the genitals and the head, fully preserving them in acetone. He said he did this just because the guy was so good looking. In 1989, he got five years probation for his sexual offense with children. This is when he went on a bit of a killing spree, almost always drugging young guys and making his unique kind of love to the corpse, then flaying the bodies or dissolving the parts in acid and sometimes keeping the skulls. He was building a skull collection, something the cops would later find to their horror. He branched out, too, in terms of what he did to the bodies. Sometimes he would take photos of himself with the dead, you can see them online, and sometimes he would just keep the heads for a while and chat with them and kiss them. He would also take photos, sometimes at each stage of the dismembering process. But perhaps the pinnacle of Dahmer's weirdness was when, after drugging one young man, he decided not to kill him outright, but to drill a hole through his skull, pour in warm water, and so render the victim in a vegetative state. Then he could have a kind of living slave. Dahmer would always say later that all he wanted was company and for the men not to leave. However, his victim woke up and was not exactly vegetized, saying to Dahmer, I have a headache. What time is it? Apparently, it was time to die, as Dahmer gave him more spiked drink and strangled the man. He tried this again with a 14-year-old, only this time injecting hydrochloric acid into the young boy's skull, the frontal lobe to be exact. He then took the semi-conscious boy to his bedroom, where his previous victim's body was still laying. 
It said the boy saw the corpse, but was too messed up to do anything. Dahmer left the boy alone at one point to go get some more beers, only to find on his return that the kid was out in the street talking to three women. They noticed the boy was bleeding from his backside and that he was in a bad way, but when a cop turned up, Dahmer said the kid was his boyfriend. The cop didn't even think to investigate. Unbelievably, despite the women's protests, the cop told Dahmer to wrap the kid up and take him back home. That he dutifully did and injected the kid's brain again with more acid. This time he died, Dahmer kept the skull and added it to his skull collection. He killed again and again, and not surprisingly, the neighbors complained of a stink and also noise pollution, saying that some dude uses a chainsaw at night indoors. Dahmer had so many body parts, and sometimes he would leave the fresh dead around so long he got a maggot infestation. With one body, he tried keeping it for weeks in water and salt so he could keep it fully intact, but that didn't work. It should be known that Jeff kept cuts of human flesh and organs in the fridge so he could eat them later. There's even a story in the media about one of his neighbors who to this day thinks the meat sandwich Dahmer gave her could have been human meat. Dahmer finally met his match with a man called Tracy Edwards, whom Dahmer almost killed, but the sensible Edwards, who was 32 at the time, knew what was coming. He assured Dahmer he wasn't going to leave him, even though Dahmer had picked up a knife, used handcuffs on him, on only one hand, and Edwards knew what the foul smell was and what the steel drum had been used for. He stayed with Dahmer five hours with a swinging handcuff, as Dahmer occasionally held a knife to him and even said he was going to eat his heart. When he got his chance, Edwards punched Dahmer and ran for it. He told cops what had happened and what he had seen, and two cops went to Dahmer's place. There they found the Polaroids, with an astonished cop telling his partner that they were certainly not fakes. Dahmer tried to fight but was held down, whereupon a search was performed and a fresh head with flesh was quickly found. Dahmer then told the stunned cops, For what I did, I should be dead. Investigators searching the house later found hearts, other organs, hands, penises, bits of tissue, an entire torso, skeletons, and of course, skulls. For his handiwork, he got 15 consecutive life terms in prison. He admitted everything and every detail, some say so he would get away with being insane. That didn't happen. Psychiatrists said he was sadistic and had antisocial personality disorder, but he was sane. They also said he was amiable, charming, and amusing to chat with. Inside prison, he read a lot of books and turned to religion, and even though he'd been separated from the general population, he persuaded the authorities to move him with the others. That was Dahmer's downfall, as he was murdered by fellow inmate and fellow murderer, Christopher Scarver, with a metal bar from the weight room. Scarver killed another guy too. Dahmer's killer later told the press that he wasn't happy about what Dahmer had done, but was also bugged out that Dahmer would make what looked like several body parts from the prison food as a way to piss off other prisoners. It's even said he added ketchup to his macabre art to imitate blood. We'll leave you with a Dahmer quote. The killing was a means to an end. That was the least satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to create living zombies with uric acid in the drill, but it never worked. No, the killing was not the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control, not having to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. This was a long show, but we think the crazy story of Dahmer deserves it. Countless plays, books, films, TV shows, and documentaries have been made about this man. In December 1978, Chicago police were just beginning to uncover the evidence of one of the most heinous crimes their city had ever seen as body after body was pulled out from under the floorboards of a seemingly ordinary suburban home. Investigators realized that they were dealing with America's most evil serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, also known as the Killer Clown, had murdered more people than any one person in US history at that point in time. John Wayne Gacy was a well-known and well-liked figure in his suburban community north of Chicago. He owned a successful construction business, attended church faithfully, and was involved in the local Polish community. He was married to his second wife and seemed to be a devoted stepfather to her two daughters. Through his position as a precinct captain for the Democratic Party, Gacy had the opportunity to meet and be photographed with First Lady Rosalind Carter in early 1978, the very same year that his horrific crimes would become public. At the time, though, Gacy was loved and admired by his neighbors, friends, and the police, and had been known for hosting elaborate parties for his entire neighborhood. Gacy's alter ego, Pogo the Clown, was often a feature of these parties, and neighbors recall that he seemed to enjoy dressing up in his clown costume and makeup and entertaining local children. But underneath Gacy's idyllic suburban life, he was hiding a dark past. Prior to moving to Chicago, Gacy had been living in Iowa, where he was arrested for assaulting two young men while his first wife was in the hospital 
giving birth to his child. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but after serving 18 months in jail, a now divorced Gacy was released on parole and received permission from the courts to relocate to Chicago for a fresh start. Soon though, Gacy's community and the world at large would learn that these secrets paled in comparison to the sadistic double life that Gacy had been leading for years. After telling his second wife that he was bisexual, the two divorced in 1976, and Gacy, now free to indulge his most sick and twisted fantasies, soon learned that killing was more satisfying to him than anything else, and he would spend the next several years trying to get his fix in the most horrific ways. It all started to unravel for Gacy with the disappearance of Robert Piest. On December 11, 1976, Robert's mother arrived to pick him up from his shift at the pharmacy where he worked. When his shift ended, Robert told his mother that he was going to talk to a man about a potential construction job that would pay more than double what he was making at the pharmacy. He told her it would only take a few minutes and then they could go home and enjoy his mother's birthday celebration. She waited outside the pharmacy, but Robert never came back. His panicked mother went home and returned to the pharmacy with her husband, other children, and the family's two German shepherds, but they could find no sign of Robert. The worried family then drove immediately to the police station to report their son missing. Lieutenant Kozensack, whose son attended the same high school as Robert, took the report. One of the first calls he made was to John Wayne Gacy. Gacy's friends and neighbors may have been oblivious to his dark past, but the police were not. Not only were they aware of his past convictions, but they had also received numerous complaints about Gacy in recent years. In 1975, after an employee of Gacy's construction company went missing, the man's family pleaded with police to investigate Gacy, but their pleas were ignored. In 1976, police had run surveillance on Gacy's home related to the disappearance of a nine-year-old boy, but they were unable to build a case against him. In 1977, a young man complained to the police about Gacy, alleging that Gacy had kidnapped him at gunpoint and assaulted him. Gacy was arrested and even admitted to his encounter with the young man, but he claimed that it was consensual and prosecutors declined to press charges. Police were also beginning to suspect that Gacy was behind a string of complaints about a man named John who had been cruising local parks and picking up young men, many of whom seemed to disappear after their encounter with John. Despite these incidents, Gacy had managed to stay one step ahead of the law so far, but his luck was about to run out. After Robert's family made their missing persons report, officers quickly realized that the man he had gone to see about a construction job must have been John Wayne Gacy. His construction company had just recently finished a renovation job at the very pharmacy where Robert had worked. The coincidence was too much to ignore, and this time the police seriously considered Gacy as a suspect in the disappearance of Robert Piest. Little did they know that this particular crime was just the tip of the iceberg, and they were about to uncover one of the most gruesome crime sprees in history. Lieutenant Kozensack contacted Gacy and asked him to come into the police station for an interview. Gacy was cordial and agreed to come in, telling officers he could be there within half an hour. Hours went by with no sign of Gacy. Officers were beginning to get suspicious when at 3 a.m. Gacy suddenly appeared at the station. His arrival did little to calm their suspicions. Gacy was more than four hours late to his interview, and when he arrived he was covered in mud and grime. The officer that Gacy had come to see wasn't available, so he was sent on his way. Later, officers would learn that Gacy's car had been towed from a snowbank near the Des Plaines River at 2 a.m. immediately before he arrived at the police station. Armed with this information, officers served Gacy with a search warrant when he returned the following day for his interview. He reluctantly handed over his keys and was detained at the station while officers searched his home. There, they found a receipt for a roll of film that Robert's family confirmed belonged to him. Police concluded that Robert had been in Gacy's home, but they could find no evidence of a crime, and so Gacy was released and placed under surveillance. The next day, officers found a ring that they linked to another missing boy, and employees of Gacy's construction company told police about two different employees of Gacy's who had mysteriously gone missing in recent months. A few days later, Gacy had the audacity to invite the officers on surveillance duty outside of his home inside for a cup of coffee. Once inside his home, both officers noticed the unmistakable stench of death. That same day, Gacy's lawyers filed a lawsuit against the police department for harassment. But before long, Gacy would have much bigger legal issues to worry about. While he was under 24-hour surveillance, officers witnessed Gacy selling marijuana to a gas station clerk, and they jumped on the opportunity to arrest him. While Gacy was in custody for drug-related charges, police officers threatened to tear up the floorboards in his home, prompting him to admit to murder. 
He tells officers that yes, he did kill a man in his home, but claims that it was self-defense. He shows police the exact spot under his garage where he buried the body, and during their search for the body, officers find a trap door leading to a crawl space under Gacy's home. Inside, amid the terrible stench of decay, officers find parts of at least three other bodies. Once he realized that the police had found the first bodies, Gacy cracked. In a rambling, hours-long confession in which he referred to himself in the third person, Gacy told police that John or Jack had killed at least 32 young men and that he had buried 27 of the bodies on his property, and he had disposed of the rest, including the body of Robert Piast in the Des Plaines River. In fact, Gacy had been dumping Robert's body in that same river on the night he was towed out of the snowbank before he showed up at the police station covered in mud. Gacy was charged with the murder of Robert Piest, although police had yet to find his body. By January 8, 1979, police had uncovered the remains of 29 bodies, but only seven had been positively identified. Gacy was charged with the murders of seven young men as police continued their efforts to identify the rest of the victims. Parents of missing boys from around the world contacted the Chicago police to find out if their sons were among Gacy's victims, and forensic specialists and dentists were called in to help identify the bodies using dental records, which in the time before DNA testing was the most reliable method of identifying victims. In April 1979, a grand jury indicted Gacy on a total of 33 murders, the largest number attributed to one person in U.S. history at the time. Throughout this, Gacy continued to give interviews to the police and even described his first murder to officers in gruesome detail. He admitted that he had stabbed his victim to death in his bedroom before burying him in the crawl space, and police found a large blood stain on the underside of the bedroom carpet that matched his story. Investigators also found a red light and a police radio in Gacy's car, prompting them to conclude that he had posed as a police officer in order to kidnap his victims. As the trial date loomed, police had still not found Robert Piest's body, but they had found his jacket under the floor of Gacy's laundry room. In January 1979, during the height of the investigation into the killer clown, the Chicago Metropolitan Clown Guild held a press conference, stating that the Gacy investigation was negatively impacting the city's professional clowns. Parents were too afraid to have their children near a clown after the details of Gacy's crimes and his alter ego Pogo the Clown were made public. Gacy's friends and neighbors recalled that he frequently joked about how clowns can get away with murder though at the time they thought he was referring to his tendency to grope women while in costume. Gacy's trial began on February 6, 1980. Due to the graphic nature of the crimes and the evidence, the judge banned anyone under the age of 16 from the courtroom. Gacy, who was facing the death penalty, pled not guilty to the charges, and his lawyers attempted to launch a defense based on insanity. But after a five-week trial, it took the jury just two hours to find John Wayne Gacy guilty of the heinous murder of 33 young men. State attorney Bernard Carey was quoted as saying he certainly qualifies for the death penalty. If he doesn't, who does? Gacy was sentenced to death by lethal injection and sent to Menard Correctional Center to await his execution. Gacy would spend the next several years on death row while his automatic appeals were exhausted. During his time on death row, Gacy took up art, painting numerous creepy pictures, of course, of clowns. Several of Gacy's paintings were auctioned off along with other inmates' art to raise money to buy art supplies for prisoners. Years later, after Gacy's death, two local businessmen purchased 30 of these paintings and invited the families of his victims to destroy them in a public bonfire. After nearly 15 years on death row, all of Gacy's appeals were exhausted and his execution date was set for May 10, 1994. Gacy's last meal consisted of fried shrimp, a pound of fresh strawberries, and a bucket of KFC chicken with fries. Prior to his murder spree and subsequent incarceration, Gacy had actually managed three KFC restaurants owned by his former father-in-law. As he was strapped into the gurney awaiting his execution, Gacy was asked if he had any last words. He snarled at his executioners, kiss my ass, and at 12.58 am he was executed by lethal injection. At the time of Gacy's execution, only 26 of his 33 victims had been positively identified. The advent of DNA testing helped police identify more of Gacy's unknown victims, including the 2011 identification of William George Bundy, a Chicago man who told his family he was going to a party and was never seen again. To this day, six victims of the killer clown remain unidentified. As a direct result of Gacy's unthinkable crimes, Chicago police spearheaded the creation of a computerized database of missing and murdered children and youths to make it easier for various police departments across the country to communicate and share information in the hopes that similar crimes could be avoided in the future. John Wayne Gacy brutally murdered 33 young men and buried their bodies under the floorboards of his home. 
He had appeared to be a successful businessman and a pillar of his community, but neighbors would soon learn that appearances can be deceiving. Hiding behind the facade was America's most evil serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown. Veteran surgeons said he hacked around inside people's bodies like a hyperactive child wielding a scalpel. He left people paralyzed, he cut through arteries and didn't seem to care as blood flowed like a fountain. He maimed and killed and he was still allowed to operate. How on earth did this happen? That's what we're going to find out today. Christopher Dunch's surgeries were so bad, so utterly disturbing in their seemingly pathological neglect of human life and human suffering, that some people who witnessed his surgical disasters thought he must have been a sociopathic imposter. But Mr. Dunch was a real surgeon. It wasn't as if he'd gotten his qualifications from the University of the Spaghetti Monster degree mill. He wasn't a complete imposter, but as you'll see, he was a sociopath. Dunch was born in Montana in 1971 and was brought up in Memphis, Tennessee. He and his three siblings were well taken care of. Their pop, a physical therapist, and mom, the teacher, gave their children everything they needed. Importantly though, Christopher was the eldest sibling. He had something to prove to Nathan, Matt, and Liz, and his parents. He wasn't lacking in talent in high school, being quite smart and showing a fairly high degree of skill in football. In fact, that's what he wanted to do at first, play football. But in college, even though he seemed to train harder than many of the other players, he just didn't cut the mustard. That was failure number one. The buds of his insecurity started growing and they were filled with poison. It's true that he attained an undergraduate degree in 1995 from Memphis State University. It's also true that he enrolled at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center to take on a difficult qualification that combined an MD and a PhD. He then did a neurosurgical residency, but something went wrong there. Instead of completing the usual 1,000 operations that are usually undertaken, he did around 100, although he was there for five years. So on paper, it was looking as though Dunch was doing everything right, despite the lack of training. He could now put an MD on his resume, but he also later added a doctorate in microbiology from St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. St. Jude didn't even run that program. Success was more important than telling the truth. That was becoming evident. He also raised millions of dollars for research regarding stem cells and their application for curing injury and disease, and on the back of two Russian scientists' research, he created two companies. The husband of the husband and wife team of Russian scientists would later say in regard to the discoveries, it wasn't his invention, it was the invention of me and my wife, because we all made primary experiments. We discovered it. By the time he started hacking at people's spines, he had a CV that was 12 pages long. To some that looked at it, they thought, what hasn't this guy done? He'd studied, worked in research, and trained for around 15 years. He seemed vastly employable. Little did most people know that Christopher Dunch could add to that CV, perhaps, in the hobbies and interests section, avid consumer of recreational drugs with preference for LSD and cocaine, especially cocaine. Dunch, often with a childhood pal Jerry Summers, would get high all night and then he'd go to work with his mind adequately frazzled while wearing dirty scrubs. Summers put his neck on the line for Dunch many times in the figurative sense, and once, unfortunately, in the literal sense. Dr. Death went to work on Summer's neck injury that left the best friend a quadriplegic. Summers trusted him, but he had no idea his buddy was far from the outstanding surgeon he pretended to be. From his wheelchair, Summers later said, before my surgery, I didn't know any bad outcomes that he had. A real surgeon later remarked on the surgery saying, Jerry Summers was effectively decapitated during the operation. He died in 2021 as a result of his condition. It's now time we talk more about Dunch's horrific operations. He was forced out of his company and then sued. He was now in debt. He also had a significant problem with the devil's dandruff, so he used that qualification spangled CV to land himself a job as a neurosurgeon at the Baylor Regional Medical Center. His salary was $600,000 a year. The problem was, as you know, but they didn't know, he wasn't really qualified to work on spines. Nonetheless, a vascular surgeon named Randall Kirby, who'd later file a complaint against Dunch, said all he heard Dunch do was brag about how great a surgeon he was. It was as if he talked a good game but played a very bad one. Kenneth Fennell was Dunch's first patient. He was left paralyzed and was only able to walk a short distance with a cane after a lot of rehabilitation. The operation wasn't a difficult one at all for a qualified surgeon. With patient Lee Passmore, Dunch cut through a ligament that was way off where he should have been cutting. He also put a screw in the wrong place, which he twisted so much he stripped the thread so he couldn't take it back out. When Passmore's two young kids and his friend turned up at the hospital and aired their concern, Dunch looked at him and said, don't worry about it. Passmore now says he has no feeling in his feet, and there are times when he's incontinent. People who were there for the operation could not believe what they'd seen, but hey, this was a new guy with that amazing CV. We won't go into every patient, but suffice to say, Dunch was dangerous. He used the wrong surgical tools and hacked at nerves and bones. He cut through a major artery in one woman and blood spouted into the air. 
He was told she might die during the operation, but he just carried on as if nothing happened. The patient did eventually die. Something like this might happen once in a lifetime for a surgeon, but it wouldn't happen a few times in such a short period. People can die during surgery, but not usually as a result of total absolute negligence. To onlookers in the operating room, Dunch seemed about as skilled at surgery as you would be after watching a few YouTube videos on spine surgery. He was accused of being drunk on the job, but when his blood was tested for alcohol, he passed. Still, a friend later said that Dunch would party all night on booze and cocaine and then just waltz into work to perform possibly life-changing surgeries. She said, I thought it was pretty amazing that he was even able to get to work the next day, like he wasn't scared. How did he not get arrested or at least fired then and there? That's the big question, and it's now one a lot of Americans are asking since they don't want their bodies ruined by a crazed surgeon. Dunch did have his surgical privileges revoked at that first hospital, and he was reviewed, but to prevent an expensive legal battle, the hospital allowed him to resign rather than risk getting sued by him for unfair dismissal. That's how it all went wrong, stage one. He started working at Dallas Medical Center and was granted some privileges to perform surgeries. The hospital still wanted to hear from Baylor and so wouldn't yet grant Dunch full privileges. He didn't get those privileges because within one week of being there, he killed a woman named Floella Brown after cutting through her vertebral artery. The next day, he operated on Mary Eford and wanted to drill into her head even though he wasn't qualified to do so. He put screws in the wrong place, he severed her nerves, and he didn't remove the disc he was supposed to remove. In short, he went at her like a child in the game operation, and there were lots of beeps. In this case, the beeps were his colleagues saying, what the hell are you doing? Some of them later said they thought he was high. When another surgeon, Robert Henderson, went in to try to correct the damage, he said it looked like Dunch had been playing with Tinker Toys. He called the operation an assault. In fact, he was so shocked at what he saw, he said this man has to be an imposter. No surgeon in the world, the entire world, could make a mess like that. Nonetheless, since Dunch was only there on a temporary basis, the hospital didn't have to report him. That could be a hassle, so Dunch just moved on. As you now realize, while he is the outright villain of this story, some blame can be put on the hospitals too. As Pontius Pilate did with Jesus, they washed their hands of him. Dunch managed to land more gigs at the Southampton Community Hospital in Dallas and at a clinic called the Legacy Surgery Center in Frisco, also in Texas. His ad hoc surgeries left one man without feeling in his right side and another man paralyzed from the neck down. Even with this huge tally of disaster to his name, he'd still walk around saying things like, everybody's doing it wrong, I'm the only clean, minimally invasive guy in the whole state. He operated on Jacqueline Troy, and as well as cutting through an artery, he severed her vocal cords. This kind of thing was unheard of in the history of modern surgery. Shortly after, with another patient, he thought a muscle was a tumor. He cut through the artery with this guy and again severed the vocal cords. Dr. Kirby, who we mentioned earlier, saw what happened. He couldn't believe his eyes. He called Dunch a maniac and said he was either trying to decapitate the patient or kill him some other way. He added that such reckless mistakes had never been seen in the history of U.S. medical care. And it's this man Kirby as well as Dr. Henderson that are the heroes of the story. They saw what was happening. Although as much as they warned people and complained to the hospitals, they couldn't get Dunch arrested or even have his license taken away from him. But then, at last, they finally managed to persuade the Texas Medical Board to suspend Dunch's license. Even then, Dunch was still trying to get his hands on more patients. He still believed he was the best out there, a delusion of grandeur likely a consequence of doing eight balls of cocaine during the evenings. That was evident in the emails he sent, which sounded like he was trying to come across as some kind of medical rapper. In one email, he wrote that he was the supernova sophisticated savant, and on top of the alliteration, he said, I do my thing, build my empire, party, and beep with models without knowing their names to make money. In yet another email, he was less lyrical, saying, Anyone close to me thinks that I am likely something between God, Einstein, and the Antichrist. In another email, he was more honest, stating, I am one of a kind, a mother beeping stone cold killer that can buy or own or steal or ruin or build whatever he wants. That would come back to bite him. The only thing he had in common with some rappers was his perpetual drug abuse, now with the added use of Oxycontin and Xanax, and a history of violence, although no rapper could touch him on his violence record. But Kirby rapped back, writing in a report that his doctor was a clear and present danger to the citizens of Texas. He and Henderson by this time had even gone back to where Dunch had done his residency and showed him a picture of him to his former supervisors. Kirby and Henderson thought someone had to be pretending to be Dunch. No one could be that bad. But it was him. There was no imposter. The people that had trained him said they knew of nothing to Dunch's detriment. This didn't ring true for the two surgeons. Henderson later said, could he have permanent brain damage from either chemicals or from some organic reason, meaning a tumor, or is this just a sociologic pathologic personality that has flipped and become a destroyer instead of a healer? 
Still, the board only suspended his license, not completely revoked it. What is going on here, thought Henderson and Kirby. There was enough evidence to prove that Dunch wasn't just the worst surgeon the world had ever seen, but that he was likely an outright psychopath with willingness to kill. Then a reporter in Dallas named Brett Schiff got hold of the story. He too couldn't believe what he'd found out. He also went after Dunch. The board subsequently asked a very well-respected surgeon to review Dunch's operations. He almost had an apoplectic fit reading about the bloody disasters. Just in one case alone, he said, there was enough proof to be certain that Dr. Dunch didn't know what he was doing. He said it was an impossibility for a neurosurgeon not to know when someone was bleeding out, as had happened with the Dunch one time. The board finally revoked the Dunch's medical license, but it had taken way too long for Dr. Henderson and Dr. Kirby. There was a reason. Henderson was recorded talking to one of the board's investigators when he asked her how could Dunch still be practicing. She answered, Sometimes we know that someone's bad, but when it comes to taking them to a hearing and proving it to where we can actually do some disciplinary action, it takes a time of gathering evidence. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes longer than we want. To write it did. There are people who'd still be walking if he'd been stopped earlier. We found other cases that involved malpractice by surgeons. They weren't anywhere near the levels of horrors committed by Dunch, but they too involved slow investigations. Kirby said with the Dunch, the action should have happened sooner. He was a special case, but maybe Dunch was so bad that no one could believe it. Kirby said in an interview, this is a once in a generation occurrence. We have someone off the rails this bad. This is why no one saw this coming. Also, let's remember that A-grade resume of Dunch's. Let's also recall that Dunch had an amazing marketing team. He appeared in TV commercials looking and sounding like a man you'd want to remove a disc from your back. Even if people looked at doctor's ratings on websites, he scored a 4.5 rating out of 5. A doctor like that is worth millions to hospitals that hired him, possibly 2.5 million bucks a year. Nonetheless, at least six doctors complained to the board about Dunch. Some of them were almost hysterical when they told the board that this man must be stopped. In December 2013, he finally was, but that didn't mean Dunch was behind bars, far from it. The lunatic was still on the loose. He was getting weirder, too. He moved to Denver, where in 2014 he was arrested for trying to get into the house of his ex-partner with whom he had a kid. Then he was arrested again for stealing stuff from Walmart worth $887.30. He shoplifted five pairs of sunglasses, a bunch of watches, some shoes, ties, some cologne, and a walkie-talkie. He was then broke. He had cracked, it seems, and was picked up one day by police wandering around and subsequently taken to a psychiatric hospital to be evaluated. He needed it. He was also picked up driving a car with two flat tires. That time he was charged with a DUI. One time again when trying to get close to his ex, she found him in her apartment covered in blood. Dressed in his scrubs, he told her he had a tussle with some medical investigators, but that wasn't true. We don't know what happened to him. In July 2015, he was indicted for causing an injury to an elderly person as well as five counts of assault. At the time of his arrest, he was staying at a hotel. Later in court, his lawyers argued that the fault lay with those who trained him, but that was a very weak defense. The prosecution pulled out some of his rapper-esque emails, showing the jury that stone-cold killer message. The jury was unanimous in saying that Dunch was guilty of intentionally or knowingly causing serious bodily injury to an elderly individual. Dunch made U.S. history, becoming the first surgeon to have been found guilty on criminal charges for his work. He was given that life sentence, but for some, there was a bigger problem than Dunch. One neurosurgeon said, the conditions which created Dr. Dunch still exist, thereby making it possible for another to come along. In total, he injured sometimes severely 33 out of 38 of his patients. Two people died as a result of his insane actions. Some victims were compensated for what had happened, but this wasn't about money. One of them said it was more about getting him off the streets. The public needs to know that there was a monster out there, the victim said. Unfortunately, as you watch this, some people are in a wheelchair or using crutches or are no longer in this world because a scalpel-wielding maniac was able to fool some people into thinking the devil didn't exist. Dunch will be eligible for parole in 2045, at which point he'll be 75. Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker, sits in court after being sentenced to death. He growls, you maggots make me sick. He composes himself and goes on, you don't understand me, you're not expected to, I will be avenged. Lucifer dwells in all of us. That's one reason this man was called evil. He was a serial killer that seemed to accept he was evil, perhaps doing the devil's bidding. He also seemed to relish his celebrity status, much like other maniacal serial killers such as Ted Bundy. One of the categories that serial killers sometimes fall into is the missionary type. Murderers who for some messed up reason think they're doing the work of a higher power. They would usually say they're working for God, cleaning up the streets, getting rid of human garbage, etc. But Ramirez seemed to think Satan had hired him. Hired for what, you might wonder? More of his ranting in court might explain that, if not entirely, given the magnitude of his madness. 
He said, I don't believe in the hypocritical moralistic dogmas of this so-called society. I need to look beyond this room to see the liars, haters, the killers, the crooks, the paranoid cowards, truly trematodes of the earth, each one in his own legal profession. If you're wondering what a trematode is, it's a kind of parasite. Ramirez blasted society for what he saw as hypocrisy, saying there are those that kill for policy, clandestinely or openly, as do governments of the world, which kill in the name of God or country. Okay, Richard, some people might have thought back then. Maybe you're right, and the governments of the world in the name of imperialism and economic power have done some rotten things, but how does that excuse what you have done, namely some of the worst crimes in the history of the USA? Now let's go back a few years. On June 28, 1984, a 79-year-old woman named Jenny Vincal was found dead in her apartment in northeast Los Angeles. Police believe she'd been sleeping when an intruder entered the property and attacked her with a knife. The assault had been so brutal that cops didn't immediately think it was a break-in gone wrong. The killer had made a point to be excessive. Ramirez didn't strike again until almost a year later. That was when he shot 22-year-old Maria Hernandez. She survived, but her roommate didn't. Less than one hour later, he shot and killed a 30-year-old woman. Two murders and one attempted murder in the space of an hour, even in violent LA, was a big deal. The press reported that some kind of ghoul was lurking in the night hours, describing him as having rotten teeth and bulging eyes. Some called him the Valley Intruder in the media a boogeyman if there ever was one. He was just getting started. Ten days later, he killed a married couple, Vincent and Maxine Zazara. When police arrived at the scene, they found Maxine's body mutilated with the eyes removed. The same kind of gun in the previous murders had been used, but now they had another clue. That was a footprint in a flower bed made by a pair of sneakers. Brand? Avia. About a month and a half later, he killed another couple. Two weeks later, he attacked two sisters, both in their 80s. He beat them viciously with a hammer and even used an electrical cord to torture one of them. Amazingly, they both survived, although one of the women died soon after from injuries. This time, the intruder had left another clue. He'd used some lipstick he found in the house to scrawl a satanic pentagram on the bedroom walls. He'd also drawn a pentagram on one of his victim's thighs. Just one day later, he entered the home of a woman and her 11-year-old son. This time, he left no dead bodies, although while attacking the woman, he shouted at her, don't look at me or I'll cut out your eyes. One time, he was trying to strangle the victim using a telephone cord when he thought he saw electrical sparks appear. He later said he left that woman alone after that, believing that Jesus had made his presence known and acted on her behalf. Did he really believe that? We think he probably did. With another victim he had tied up, he demanded to know where all the valuables in the house were. He screamed at her to tell the truth, saying, swear on Satan. He did that the same night he killed another elderly woman. Footprints were found on her battered face. They could be traced back to a pair of Avia sneakers. Two weeks later, he used a machete and a gun to kill another elderly married couple. Again, he took many valuables from the house. Okay, so what were the police looking at? In terms of criminal profiles, this case was a little bit unusual in the sense that the serial killer stole from the victims. Many serial killers have no interest whatsoever in monetary gain. The act of killing is psychosexual. The impetus is gratification, not having cash to spend on new things. Then there were the satanic symbols and the talk about Satan. Ramirez had also signed one of his murder scenes with Jack the Knife, perhaps in relation to the infamous Jack the Ripper. Like the never-caught Jack in London, this killer wanted recognition for his crimes. But in the terminology of the FBI profilers, the LA killer didn't seem to be organized or at least not very organized. Organized killers like Ted Bundy usually have studied police tactics and go to great pains to avoid arrest. They're often quite bright and can be the guy next door with a good job rather than street hustling heavy drug users like Ramirez. If Ramirez was what criminologists call forensically aware, he sometimes didn't show it. He left footprints behind when a more astute killer would have known not to do that. He also was seen by some of his victims and he let them live. According to the FBI's serial killer catching folks, named the Behavioral Science unit, think Silence of the Lambs, this killer didn't really fit into any kind of category. He was a bit of everything. He obviously got off on having power over victims. He was no doubt a sadist, given how he tortured some of them, but he was also a two-bit thief. On top of that, serial killers, at least the organized type, usually planned their murders, sometimes meticulously. With this killer, it was as if he was going on some kind of mad rampage. His crimes came one after the other. Another of them involved Ramirez entering a family home. He killed the man immediately, and after viciously attacking the woman, again he made her swear on Satan as he asked her where all the valuables were kept. In this case, he didn't just not attack the child, but he sent him to a neighbor where he said he'd be safe. Police then got a break. 
Yet again, after another attack, they found a footprint, and it was almost certainly from a pair of Avia shoes. Detectives discovered that this particular style wasn't all that common in the US, which was great for the case. They found out that very few pairs of that style shipped in the US were size 11 and a half. In fact, to get that size in LA was almost impossible, given that only one store in the city had received a pair. They could also link the crimes with ballistic evidence. But there's a good reason the police didn't tell the press or anyone about their leads. The reason, of course, is if matters of their investigation get out, the killer will be tipped off. Goes without saying that most killers follow their crimes on the news. Sure, police release sketches of criminals because the public can come forward if they think they know the person, but cops also hold a lot back. One reason is not to tip the criminal off, and another is so during interrogation, the accused might say something only the perpetrator could possibly know. In this case, the then mayor of San Francisco, Dianne Feinstein, held a press conference and talked about the shoes and the caliber of the gun. Without a doubt, Mayor Feinstein made a big mistake, a detective later said. The mistake was about as foolish as the Nazis publicly releasing the details of their up-and-coming blitzkrieg. So, what did Ramirez do after watching that on the TV? Of course, he got rid of the shoes, taking them to the Golden Gate Bridge and throwing them down into the water. This was a massive setback for the cops. Imagine they'd have arrested Ramirez with a matching gun and a pair of shoes that were pretty much the four-leaf clover of footwear. Feinstein, by the way, had been told about the details of the LA crimes because of a similar crime in San Francisco, but she wasn't meant to talk about the details in public. She did at least do some things right. One was stating the obvious. She said this is a very serious situation. The killer goes into a home at night and kills at random. Somewhere in the Bay Area, someone is renting a room, an apartment, or a home to this vicious serial killer. Still, Ramirez was a bit stupid because he didn't throw away the gun like just about every detective thought he would. About a week later, he was skulking outside another family home, this time in Orange County. He was chased away, but the man of the house could describe to the cops the car and part of the license number. He had no idea it was the car of the Night Stalker. That same night, Ramirez entered another house and shot a man in the head three times. He tied up the man's wife, beating her and telling her to repeat to him that she loved Satan. He left her alive and told her to inform police, tell them the Night Stalker was here. The man actually survived after surgery. Police not only found another footprint, but despite Ramirez's best efforts to clean his dumped stolen car, a fingerprint was taken from the rearview mirror. What Ramirez didn't know is that California had recently acquired a new machine. That was a $25 million computer system with the name CalID. Police could run a fingerprint through that, and it would be matched with fingerprints from other crimes. This was pretty high-tech back in those days. While it's said that this solved the case, it isn't strictly true. Police already had a bunch of leads from all the stuff that Ramirez had stolen from his many victims. He'd fenced them on the streets, and some of the items police had a trail on. The person that had sold them, they were told, was named Ricardo, or perhaps just Rick. Cops then released the mugshot of Ramirez that had been taken after he was arrested for stealing a car in 1984. They also issued a statement saying, we know who you are now, and soon everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide. They knew they were looking for a 25-year-old drifter from Texas with a history of drug use. What they didn't know is that this kid had witnessed a murder when young, and on top of other traumas, he was a pretty messed up youngster. Not that many people knew Ramirez because he was mostly a loner who moved around taking drugs wherever he could find them. Alone at home, he watched just about every variety of slasher movie when he wasn't listening to Black Sabbath, ACDC, and post-Sabbath Ozzy Osbourne. We won't criticize his music choices, but for Ramirez, listening to dark tunes was a way to rebel against his violent father and a very religious mother. Mix in a bit of LSD, amphetamine, and PCP, and sprinkle on that the murder he saw and maybe some more violence. And as one serial killer author put it, by the time Ramirez was 17, his brain was seriously fried. Ramirez moved on to cocaine through the main line, and at times when high, he would read the satanic bible and attend satanic rituals. After that, he started killing. He was now in hiding, although he hadn't checked the news and had no idea countless people had seen his photograph. His face was plastered over just about every front page newspaper in California, but he didn't know that when he got on a bus heading to see his brother in Arizona. If he'd only gone to a newspaper stand, he would have seen his face staring back at him. This guy was walking around when the vast majority of people wouldn't have minded lynching him. He managed at one point to walk past some cops who were looking for him, and then he walked into a convenience store. The thing was, a group of elderly women had seen him. They were almost shaking, saying to each other, El Matador, the killer in Spanish. Inside this door, things had changed for Ramirez. 
That's because he now saw in front of him newspapers showing his face. He walked back outside where there were more people pointing at him. He made a run for it, sprinting across the freeway and then unsuccessfully trying to steal a car. He ran some more, jumping over garden fences and tried again to steal a car. Now helicopters were buzzing overhead. Ramirez managed to get inside one car whose occupant was Angie De La Torre. He punched her in the stomach and got hold of the keys, but her 57-year-old neighbor Jose Burgoyne was soon on the scene. This is what Burgoyne later told the media. I ran to defend her, and he told me, don't get closer or I'll shoot you. I didn't see a gun, so I opened the door and pulled him out of the car. More people arrived on the scene, and it was mayhem. The Night Stalker was now a daytime brawler, and he wasn't so good at it. De La Torre's husband turned up, and he furiously whacked Ramirez over the head with what he described as a barbecue utensil. Ramirez fled again, only to be chased down the street that was starting to look like the gauntlet in a version of Mexican-American gladiators, where the weapons of choice were not made out of soft rubber. Someone hit Ramirez over the head with a fence post, and that was it. He was down. The jostling crowd now laid into him and beat him badly. He might have received a public execution there and then had some folks not held back and the police intervened. Ramirez was later given a date with the gas chamber. As often happens with serial killers, women sent him fan mail while he was in prison. He even married a woman during his incarceration. The Night Stalker never was killed by the state, dying instead from complications due to B-cell lymphoma in 2013. He was 53. The year is 1894, and police in Chicago enter a building known as the Murder Castle. That day, the cops find rooms with movable walls. They discover chutes in those rooms that lead to a basement, where vats of acid could turn a human body into mush. Around the entire building are a labyrinth of corridors, some that lead nowhere. Some of the hallways contain rooms that have vents built into them, where noxious gases can be released. Down in the basement are the grisliest discoveries, an operating table where bodies have been dissected, and worse, a kind of stretching rack where one could perform the most diabolical experiments. This shocking discovery would open the floodgates to the discovery of the atrocities committed by Mr. Henry Howard Holmes, real-life Saw villain and one of America's most evil serial killers. And this is how it all unraveled. He wasn't born Henry Howard Holmes, he made that name up later in an effort to distance himself from his dastardly deeds. He was actually born with the name Herman Webster Mudgett. On May 16, 1861, he became the third child of Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodot Page Prince, English immigrants living in New Hampshire. As a kid, he excelled in school, which landed him a place at the respectable Phillips Exeter Academy. He graduated, he took work as a teacher, he married young and had a child. This was a young man that seemed destined to live a quiet life within the middle classes of the American public. But something happened, and darkness encroached on the young man's life. Age 18, now with wife and child, he enrolled at the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. He graduated and was said to be a brilliant student, if not a person with some strange inclinations. It was while studying in the anatomy department at this university that he began his life of crime. The crimes were simple, if not macabre. He worked in the anatomy department of the college, a job that gave him access to bodies that were to be dissected. Some of those cadavers he sneaked out of the department and bashed them around a bit, making it look like they died in an accident. Prior to doing this, the young student had taken out insurance policies on those people. You'd think this would not be so easy to do, even back then, but it's alleged he committed this scam on quite a few occasions. He had cash in his pocket, a wife, and an infant child. But it seems he wasn't interested in staying settled down for long. One day, he just took off, leaving the two behind, and they would not see him again for a very long time. Just before he left, he created a highly fictitious story that he knew would get back to them. They heard from others that he'd been in some kind of train accident and lost his memory. As outlandish as it seems, it kind of worked, and such lies would work again for him in the future. He ended up in New York State, and while there he was connected to the disappearance of a young boy. Did he kill the boy? It's now thought he did, but no one can be sure. He also tried to scam an insurance company out of $20,000 by using another cadaver he'd taken a policy out on, but this time he was caught. He was now getting quite the name for himself, so naturally, he changed his name. Herman Webster Mudgett became H. H. Holmes. It was at this point that he moved to Chicago, a place where his name would be cemented in history. He married again, illegally of course since he hadn't divorced, and he started to make plans for future scams. He made sure to marry into a wealthy family. He was obviously well-educated, well-spoken, and you could say he had the gift of gab. That's why he was always able to secure loans to buy properties. Uh -huh. To pay those loans back, he got loans on the properties he already had. 
He bit off more than he could chew, but when creditors went after him, he always seemed to get himself out of the fix. One of the ways he did this was to move around a bit. And so now we come to one of the most recognized addresses in crime history, that of 63rd and Wallace Streets, where he worked as a clerk in a drugstore that was on the bottom floor. With some cunning, he managed to take it over, and once that was done, he took over much of the building. This was a massive place with rows of stores at the bottom and apartments on the third floor. Then there was a second floor where Holmes would create his house of horrors. And as you know, the basement is where the very ugly stuff went on. He was still scamming, of course, selling from his drugstore magical drinks that could allegedly stop alcoholism in its tracks. He sold a Canadian man an invention for $2,000, although the gas-making machine wasn't what it seemed. He also sold water that he said was a cure for every ailment, which was water Holmes was stealing from the water mains. Suffice to say, this man knew his way around industrial piping. This would help him later when he gassed people to death. Holmes never stopped working on his building, telling people that he was creating a hotel for the soon-to-arrive World's Fair. In truth, he was creating a monster of a building that didn't make any sense. He'd hire contractors and then fire them partway through the job. He was creating a house of many doors, landings, and rooms that just didn't look like anything anyone had ever seen. You could walk down one hallway and it would just end. Rooms had no doors. Others had trap doors. How did he get away with not paying all the people to build this horror castle? The answer is he'd lie through his teeth. And when that didn't work, he changed the names on the ownership documents. Fictitious people owned the building, as did a fictitious company run by people that didn't exist. His mother-in-law even owned the place at one point. It was at this point in time that Holmes began killing people in that building. There was his assistant, Julia, who was with child and husband when she started working in the drugstore. She began an affair with Holmes, so her husband took off. She and her child one day went missing and were never seen again. There were other women who Holmes' wife didn't know about since she didn't live at the castle with him. Holmes could meet someone on the street, use his gift of speech to impress them, and within no time at all, found themselves staying in a weird room on the second floor. Holmes had learned a thing or two while building the monstrosity. He fitted alarms around the building so when someone opened a door or stepped on a certain step in his room, he'd hear a bell ring. He'd then know they were on the move. Many rooms could be locked only from the outside. So when one of those rooms started to fill with poisonous gas, the occupant would not be able to get out. It's also alleged that one person was burned to death in a room whose walls had been made from fireproof material. There were other rooms that once the door had been closed, they became almost airless. So within a matter of time, the victim would be suffocated. After such an event took place, Holmes could easily get the body down to the basement since the room had been fitted with a chute. Other rooms were connected to small elevators. Sometimes he might have just locked a door and let that person die of dehydration. Years later, he admitted he starved a woman in that room. When the bodies hit the dissecting table, Holmes would go to work on them. Having worked in the medical profession, he knew very well that organs and other body parts were expensive and in high demand. He would take what he wanted from the bodies and throw the waste into vats of lime or acid. He might have done something much worse, too. Okay, so surely someone must have been onto him. This was a man with a lot of skeletons in his closets, possibly literally as well as figuratively. But first, you need to know that during the time Holmes had met a man in Chicago named Benjamin F. Pitzel. Pitzel was no stranger to crime himself, but the jury's still out on whether these two became partners in crime. Holmes then met and married a woman named Minnie Williams. He was actually married to three women now, and there'd also be a fourth. After marrying Williams, he managed to get her to sign the deed to her property to a man that was just another alias of Holmes. The deed would eventually be signed over to another man who was an alias of Pitzel. And if that all looks suspicious, it was. Minnie's sister Annie went to Chicago to meet her sister and her mysterious new husband, and neither she nor her sister were ever seen again. They both likely became unwitting organ donors. To cover his tracks, Holmes wrote a letter to the girl's aunt signed by Annie that said things were going swimmingly and she and her sister were heading off to Europe. An actual, real letter was written much earlier to Minnie from Annie. In that missive, Minnie wrote that she'd met a man named Harry Gordon, whom she described as handsome, wealthy, and highly intelligent. Holmes would later tell cops that Minnie had killed Annie after the two of them had vied for his attention, but it's unlikely this was the case. What we know for sure is that Holmes had many relationships, some with the 150 young women who worked for him during those years. It's also true that when the World's Fair came to Chicago, there were a lot of missing persons cases. In 1893, things started to come undone for Holmes. He ripped off too many creditors, and some of them were after him. For that reason, he tried to claim on insurance for a fire at the building, which he actually started himself. The police now knew this guy had a bad reputation, and one investigator named F.G. Cowie looked into Holmes' past. The conclusion of the cop was something seemed awfully wrong about this educated fella. 
In 1894, Holmes already fled Chicago to go live in the house he'd scammed out of the Williams sisters. While there, he was jailed for trying to commit another scam. While in that jail, he told a man about a plan he had to take out a life insurance policy on himself and then fake his own death. He needed the guy's help, and if that was forthcoming, he'd cut the guy in on the scam. In the end, faking his own death didn't work and the other criminal didn't receive any money. It was then that Holmes turned to Pitzel again for help. He told him that he should fake his death. The plan was for Holmes to create an inventor named B.F. Perry, who was actually Pitzel. This guy would die in a lab experiment gone wrong, but the body that police would find would be a cadaver that Holmes had acquired. After that, Holmes and Pitzel would collect on the life insurance policy. Except Holmes, being Holmes, didn't want to share the loot, so one day he turned up at Pitzel's house, knocked him out with chloroform, and burned his body, making it look like an explosion had happened in the lab. Holmes was then in the money because he'd actually taken out a life insurance policy on the real Pitzel. Holmes went to Mrs. Pitzel's house and told her that her husband was doing some business in London, England. He told her that he could help take care of her five kids, of which three left that day with Holmes. The kids were never seen again. Holmes later said he forced two of them to get inside a large trunk. Once they were in, he made a hole and pumped gas in there through a hose. Not long after an investigator was on the lookout for Holmes and the three missing kids, the cops discovered the remains of the girls at the house where Holmes was staying and they found teeth and some chopped up bits of the boy in the chimney. The game was almost up. Investigators now started to put this man's life under a microscope. It didn't take long to understand that many people had gone missing who'd been unfortunate enough to cross his path. It's then they went to the castle and they made those grisly discoveries. What's worse, they found what looked like a rack. It was assumed by some that Holmes had used it to torture people into telling him what he wanted to know. It was also understood that for a while Holmes had been working on a theory. He believed that if you slowly stretched a body, it would become taller over time. He wrote that by doing this, humans could create a race of giants. It'll never be known if he actually stretched some of his victims in an attempt to see if he was right. On October 28, 1895, Holmes represented himself for the first day of his trial. It was said that he showed a remarkable familiarity with the law. Still, today a lot is uncertain about his crimes and his motives. The biggest number put forward is that he killed 200 people, although it's certain that he killed nine. He confessed to 27 murders, but then again, he told a lot of lies. May 7, 1896, the day of his execution by hanging. Holmes was said to have looked very calm. His neck didn't break immediately, so his body twitched for a good 15 minutes. After 20 minutes, he was pronounced dead. As for his final words, not long before he departed this world, he had asked if he could be buried deep under concrete. He was worried someone might steal his body and sell his organs. 1944, the Gestapo HQ in the French city of Lyon. A bloodied young woman, her teeth broken, her face black and blue is strapped to a chair. Her interrogator enters the room. As usual, he's holding his beloved cat in his arms. It's time for the next round of torture. You will talk to me today, Simone, he says, smiling. He puts his cat on a chair and walks over to a toolbox. Simone will live with this day for the rest of her life. The man, who sounds something like a James Bond villain, is Klaus Barbie, aka the Butcher of Leon. His crimes would go on for decades. The atrocities he committed with the Nazis were just the beginning of a long career as an interrogator and torturer. And what's more disturbing is the fact that he managed to stay out of the clutches of the law because he had some help from the apparent good guys, perhaps the best help a man could have. His benefactor was none other than the government of the USA. He heard that right. And if that surprises you, this same man was also once friends with the king of cocaine, Pablo Escobar not to mention some of the most rotten dictators this world has ever seen. Yet, this is a complicated tale and one that sounds like fiction, but we've done our research, it's true. And it's such a shocking expose that there were a fair few people that hoped the story would never come out. The woman in that intro was named Simone Lagrange. She was just 13 when she endured eight days of torture at the hands of Barbie, something that she would later testify to. Suspected to be a member of the French resistance, Barbie beat her within an inch of her life, hoping she might give up her friends. Each day, he'd enter the room where she was tied up, often carrying his pet cat. She later said he seemed to take great pleasure in the torture, saying his smile was like a knife blade. He was a sadist, a maniac, armed with a toolbox of weapons. Lagrange said he busted her up good, one time breaking a vertebrae in her back with a spiked ball on the end of a stick. She wasn't the only one to suffer at the hands of this madman. A French Jew named Lise Le Sèvre later testified that she was interrogated and tortured for days on end before being sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Barbie took pleasure, a pleasure that was astounding and torturing, she said, adding that he hung her up by her wrists for 10 days while doing the unimaginable to her. 
To make matters worse, both her husband and her son were gassed by the Nazis at the Auschwitz death camp, and Nat Leger met him too in France. She later testified, he had the eyes of a monster. He was a savage. My God, he was a savage. It was unimaginable. He broke my teeth. He pulled my hair back. He put a bottle in my mouth and pushed it until the lips split from the pressure. She said she could never forget those eyes which were imprinted in her mind forever. She actually later lost the use of her sight as she starved in a Nazi death camp. How does the man end up this way? We hear the word monster, but we're also familiar with the term the banality of evil. The Butcher of Lyon once had been a kid. He, like everyone else, had played in the park, ridden his bicycle with his friends, celebrated Christmas with his family. But somewhere along the line, he became as close to evil as one can imagine. So what happened? He was born in Gottesburg, Germany on October 25, 1913. Some of his first memories were of his father, also named Nicholas, coming back from fighting in World War II. Nicholas had been through a hell of his own, first being severely wounded in the neck on the battlefield and later being captured by the French army. Nicholas barely survived the war, but his injuries were not just physical. Germany had been humiliated. He had been humiliated. He came back with that look in his eyes, what you might call the thousand-yard stare. He took straight to the bottle, beating his wife, Klaus, and his brother, screaming at them about how much he detested the French. Suffice to say, this had a profound impact on Klaus Jr. Nonetheless, Klaus did okay in school. He excelled in languages and had dreams of studying theology, perhaps one day working as an academic himself. But then, in 1933, when he was just 20, everything fell apart. First, his brother Kurt died after struggling with a chronic illness. A few months later, his alcoholic father passed away. This was in 1933, the same year that Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Germany. Klaus's family were now destitute, just as many Germans were, and it was this man, Adolf Hitler, that promised to bring prosperity back to the country. So, with hope in his heart and a fair bit of anger, at age 22, Barbie started working for the Reichsarbeitsdienst, a kind of Nazi labor service that promised to save young men like Klaus from the ravages of what had become widespread poverty. But as things went, to be employed there meant to be embracing hateful Nazi ideology. Barbie welcomed that with open arms. Soon he joined the SS, member 272,284, and that led to him signing up for the Nazi intelligence service, the Sicherheitsdienst, a sister organization of the sinister Gestapo. In 1937 he joined the Nazi party, member 4,583,085. That's how the career began for a man who would devote his entire life to committing crimes against humanity. Following the German occupation of the Netherlands, Barbie worked under Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann would become one of the major players in the genocide committed by the Nazis, what we now call the Holocaust. He was very fond of Barbie, who quite early in his career made a name for himself locating Dutch Jews and Freemasons. Little is said about how the Nazis persecuted the Masons, which they said were hostile to the state. Lodges were closed down, members were hounded, valuables were stolen or burned, and even if they weren't Jewish, they were often accused of conspiring with the Jews. Thousands of them were sent to the camps. As was Hermannus von Tongeren, the Grand Master of the Grand Orient of the Netherlands, captured by none other than Klaus Barbie. He went on to the Sachsenhausen camp, where after enduring two weeks of freezing temperatures, he died. He was just one victim who'd been captured by the hardworking Barbie. For his efforts, commended by many in the Nazi party, Barbie was then sent to Dijon, France, where he again was tasked with tracking down anyone the Nazis believed was their enemy. Barbie soon ended up in Lyon, not far from Dijon, and there he became the head of the Gestapo whose headquarters were at the famed Le Hotel Terminus, quite an apt name for a place where people were tortured and killed. It was there that Barbie's work was mainly focused on finding members of the French resistance. This was a collection of underground organizations that close to the end of the war had started becoming quite effective in upsetting the Nazis and collaborating Vichy government. Those brave people used guerrilla warfare against the Nazis and provided the Allies with extremely valuable intelligence. They were diverse in terms of religion, politics, wealth, ethnicity, and age. Their unifying cause was to fight against the Nazis, for which they were hunted like animals. Many French people at the start of the occupation had just got on with things. Many were even anti-Semitic and welcomed the Nazis, embracing the constant propaganda in the media that included daily anti-British, anti-Semitic, and anti-communist sentiment. Every day, propagandistic articles would talk about this wonderful collaboration of two countries, stating that one day they would become the new order in Europe. There was a climate of fear, to say the least, and if you were French and anti-Nazi, you lived daily knowing that there was a good chance you might end up in a chair with a hood over your head, tortured and then killed. 
Just to give you an example of how imperiled these times were for the anti-Nazi French, in 1944 the Germans marched into the village of Orador Suglan in Nazi-occupied France. It had been rumored that a Waffen-SS officer had earlier been taken hostage in the village and killed. When the army arrived, they demanded everyone go to the village square. This even included six people who'd been passing through the village on bicycles. The adult males were then sent to a barn and shot with machine guns. Those still breathing died in the flames after the Nazis set fire to the place. Only one man survived to tell the tale. The women and children had been sent to a church at this point, which was then fired upon by Nazi machine guns. 247 innocent women and 205 children died, with only one woman escaping. Of the remaining people, some who tried to run from the village, they were also gunned down, man, woman, and child. 642 people were killed in total. This was what the French resistance fighters were up against. One of them, named Giselle Guillemot, later explained, Some days I would be seized by irrepressible anxiety. The fleeting vision of a man in a trench coat through the reflection of a shop window would instantly plunge me into a state of total panic. A suspicious noise on the staircase, and I would think I was about to be arrested, taken to the Gestapo and tortured. The torturer was often Mr. Barbie in that hotel. Men, women, and children were sent to him for interrogation. Those bloody interviews were never over quickly, with the resistance, if they even were resistance, always reluctant to give up names. It was the same with the people accused of being communists or Jews. But what's perplexing is the delight that Barbie seemed to take in torturing people, perhaps partly a consequence of his own violent father hating the French. For anyone being tortured by him, it was the wickedness of his smile that made them consider what you could call the total depravity of man. As that woman in the intro said later, he was caressing the cat, and me, a kid 13 years old, I could not imagine that he could be evil because he loved animals. I was tortured by him for eight days. She added, he always came with his thin smile like a knife blade, then he smashed my face. Jean Moulin, one of the heroes of the French resistance and a friend to the future president of France, Charles de Gaulle, was strung up and beaten with sticks until his arms, legs, and ribs were broken. His knuckles were smashed in a door frame, and hot needles were placed under his fingernails. Another prisoner, Christian Pinot, said Moulin never talked through all of this. Pinot explained what Moulin looked like after the torture session, saying, he was unconscious, his eyes dug in as though they had been punched through his head. An ugly blue wound scarred his temple. A mute rattle came out of his swollen lips. His face was bloated to the extreme, which is why Barbie sadistically ordered Pinot to shave Moulin. Pinot later said, I couldn't understand why they wanted to put on this macabre performance for a dying man. When I'd finished, I just sat next to him. Suddenly, Moulin asked for some water. I gave him a drink. Then he spoke in a croaking voice a few words in English, which I didn't understand. Soon after he lost consciousness, I just sat with him, a sort of death watch until I was taken back to my cell. Moulin died soon after, having not told Barbie anything. If you find it hard to understand why Barbie would ask a prisoner to shave a dying man, Pinot also explained this. Looking back, I sometimes even think that he wasn't even that interested in getting any information. Fundamentally, he was a sadist who enjoyed causing pain and proving his power. He had an extraordinary fund of violence. Koch's clubs and whips lay on his desk. He used them a lot. Lise Le Sèvre, who we also mentioned earlier, was hung up and beaten with a bar. One day, Barbie ordered her to strip and then forced her into a bathtub full of ice. He pushed her head in the freezing water for as long as she could take it, and he smiled as he did it. He left her there freezing with her legs tied over a pipe at the end of the tub. She held out and never spoke, with Barbie becoming more frustrated every day. He seemed to be after a certain man, asking her time and time again, who is the dear, where is the dear? After he'd literally broken her, he seemed to almost give up. She testified later, he told me, I admire you, but in the end, everybody talks. What you have done is magnificent, my dear. Nobody has held out as long as you. It's nearly over now. I'm very upset. But let's finish. Go on. A little effort. Who is Didier? But she didn't say anything. Not even after she'd seen him beat others to death. The last thing she ever heard Barbie say was, liquidator. I don't want to see her anymore. On February 9th, 1943, Barbie was behind something that would later become known as the Rue St. Catherine Roundup. This was a day when the Gestapo knew there would be Jewish people on St. Catherine Street in Lyon. Jewish refugees were going to be there that day to receive assistance from some kind-hearted local folks. 86 Jewish men and women were rounded up, with 83 of them being sent to death camps. At one point, Barbie had scores of people in one room, each of them not knowing how much time they had left on the earth. Some people convinced Barbie that they weren't in fact Jewish. They subsequently were let go, but many years later they would speak at a trial and explain how Barbie was the main man in the roundup. 
The others were put into two trucks and sent to a temporary prison, and from the 83 that ended up in the extermination camps, only three survived to tell the tale. Adolf Hitler saw this as a great achievement. For the roundup and for the capture of Mulan, Hitler awarded Barbie the first class iron. It's hard to say how many people were killed by Barbie or died because of them, but the number has been put at 4,000, 44 of whom were Jewish kids taken from an orphanage in the town of Izhu. A witness who saw the Nazi truck arrive and Barbie and his men get out escaped by jumping through a window. She later recalled, I heard the cries of the children that were being kidnapped, and I heard the shouts of the Nazis who were carrying them away. They threw the children into the trucks like they were sacks of potatoes. Most of them were crying, terrorized. They were put on trains heading to the death camp, and not one of them returned. A survivor later talked about seeing the kids arrive at the camp. At the time, he wasn't aware of what was happening, and he asked another prisoner what the Nazis would do with a bunch of kids. After all, they were too young to work. This was the reply he got. You see that chimney? The one smoke never stops coming out of? You smell that odor? Of burned flesh? The Izhu orphanage would one day come back to haunt Barbie, but much would happen in the meantime. All these people would likely have survived the war had Barbie not found them. Witnesses later said when he did discover them, he'd sometimes say to them, have you heard of the Gestapo kitchens? He also liked to say, where you're going is worse than death. This was a man that took great pleasure from seeing people's fear. As you know, Germany lost the war. The Russians walked into Berlin, and somewhere in a bunker, Adolf Hitler was having a secretary take down his final words. On April 30th, 1945, Hitler was a dead man, as were many high-ranking Nazis. Some, though, went into hiding. The war in Europe was over, and Japan soon surrendered after two devastating atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In the region of 75 million people died because of this war. People hoped that the now nightmare was over, but a new nightmare was just beginning. As people were still in recovery from the war, officials in the West were talking about the new threat of communism. At the time, higher-ranking Nazis were busy trying to avoid detection, but Klaus Barbie's name was already in the hands of the French authorities. Barbie had seen to it that many people who had first-hand knowledge of his crimes were killed, but there were still many people whose testimony would result in him hanging by a rope. He had fled from France to Germany, whereupon it seems at first he was recruited by British intelligence. That was after taking a beating, and for once him being on the other end of the interrogation. What he told the Brits was useful information, such as which SS officers might be of use to them. Remember, Barbie knew who was who in Germany and France, including who the secret communists were. This made him a prized asset. It seems his activities with the British were short-lived, and soon he was working with the US Army Counterintelligence Corps, or CIC, after being captured during Operation Selection Board. He might have been working for both the Americans and the British, it's hard to say, but his relationship with the US would span decades. These different agencies already knew some things about his war activities, but it was decided it was better for them if Barbie worked as a spy than give him to the French. US officials told him if he worked for them, he would live very comfortably and get hundreds of dollars for his anti-communist work. He was secretly housed by the CIC and asked to spy on people the Americans thought might be working for the Soviet agencies, the KGB and the GPU. On April 1, 1950, his name appeared on a search and arrest list that had been given to the German police. Barbie was informed about this by a friend who was a German cop, so he went to the Americans and aired his concern. He said something along the lines of, hey, I'm working for you now, make my name disappear. A file in the US National Archives said suspending his activities, they nevertheless kept him on the payroll in order to keep him under control and undercover while a frantic debate went on as to his disposition. But soon the French Ministry of Interior was on the case, telling the Americans they wanted this man for war crimes. It seems at this point the Americans were in a bit of a conundrum, according to that National Archives file. Barbie already knew too much about German spies who American intelligence had planted in communist organizations all over Europe. If they were to hand Barbie over, he might perhaps talk a bit too much and ruin some precious operations. It was also a bit of an embarrassment to the US that they'd hired a war criminal. The file explains what happened next. Stating in 1951, the CIC sponsored his escape to South America via a rat line operating through Italy. Rat lines were the escape routes that many Nazi war criminals used after the war, including big names such as Joseph Mengele, aka the Angel of Death. The rat line for Barbie was partly created by US intelligence. They also got some help from another tyrant on their payroll. In the meantime, the French were not happy at all, telling the Americans to hand Barbie over to be executed. They had sentenced Barbie for his crimes in absentia, meaning he was absent at the sentencing. Things got political, with the French telling John J. McCloy, the US High Commissioner for Germany, that this was not what countries should do. McCloy refused to budge. 
If you're wondering how such a thing could happen, it was basically because in the grand scheme of things one man hanging on a rope in France didn't mean much to the US, but having a valuable spy talking about American intelligence activities was extremely important. Years later, the US admitted what its intelligence services had done following an investigation by the Justice Department. In a statement the DOJ wrote, they were acting within the scope of their official duties. Their actions were taken not for personal gain or to shield them personally from liability or discipline, but to protect what they believed to be the interests of the United States Army and the United States government. Keeping Barbie away from the clutches of the French was for the so-called greater good. You might disagree with this when you see what this monster went on to do, which you'll have to admit was pretty extreme even when compared to his Nazi career. By the way, the Justice Department admitted that while US intelligence had acted in the interest of the country, what had happened was still wrong. The DOJ also said it's a principle of democracy and the rule of law that justice delayed is justice denied. If we are to be faithful to that principle and we should be faithful to it, we cannot pretend that it applies only to within our borders and nowhere else. The department said the US expressed regret and should be a priority now to help France get Barbie. As the saying goes, too little, too late. So Barbie needed to get out of Germany. To do that, US intelligence contacted a Croatian priest named Dr. Krunoslav Draganovic. Draganovic helped hundreds of Nazi war criminals escape to South America via rat lines. He also was working for the US counterintelligence corps. He was a murderous fascist and a member of the Ustache, a Croatian fascist organization that was also responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people, mostly Orthodox Serbs but also Jews. The US knew this, but with Draganovic being so rapidly anti-communist, he was an asset. He was employed by the CIC and later the CIA to help America fight communism. After many years of working together, the CIA eventually cut ties with Draganovic, stating that he was not amenable to control, too knowledgeable of unit personnel and activity, demanded outrageous monetary tribute, and US support of Croat organizations. If you were to ask a US intelligence agent about his job, he'd say, it's complicated. Things might seem less complicated when we tell you that as a part of something called Operation Bloodstone, the CIA covertly hired quite a lot of high-ranking Nazi intelligence agents to work for the agency all over the world. They'd committed war crimes, of course, but when on the US payroll, they needed protecting. There's even a CIC memo that gets talked about the cost of sending Nazis and other war criminals through the rat lines. It goes, the 430th CIC detachment has been operating what they term a rat line evacuation system to Central and South America without serious repercussions during the past three years. At the cost of approximately $1,000 each adult, 430th CIC is transferring evacuees to Italy where they are provided with legal documentation obtained through devious means there. So off Barbie went for a grand destination Bolivia, where he settled in a lovely little city called Cochabamba at the foot of the Andes Mountains. Known as the City of Eternal Spring, this was a wonderful place to lay your hat compared to war-torn Germany. Barbie had landed on his feet, that's for sure, and my god would he play a big role in shaping his new home. His history of violence and spying made him an attractive prospect for ungodly future employers. What we mean to say is Barbie became a friend to dictators and drug lords. It should be known that during this paranoid period in history, the US was always willing to give a helping hand to any human rights violating dictator if, of course, that helped stop the rising tide of communism. It seemed that Barbie rubbed shoulders with the ultra-right wing of Bolivia, winning favors with them by occasionally teaching such men how to properly spy, interrogate, and torture. So in a way, Barbie was once again working on the side of the US. He did just that under the extremely oppressive government of René Barrientos, who was in power twice from 1964 to 1966 and then from 1966 to 1969 after becoming leader by way of a military-backed coup. Marientos was no fan of leftist ideology, and he was more than willing to violently oppose anyone who went against him, such as the Argentine Marxist revolutionary named Che Guevara, a man whom Barbie would later brag he helped the Americans hunt. Guevara had been trying to overthrow the military dictatorship in Bolivia, which made him a threat not only to the tyrants in power, but also a threat to the US. On October 8, 1969, the Bolivian forces backed by the Americans fought with Guevara and his guerrilla army. Guevara was dead a day later, his hands removed, and his body buried in an unmarked grave. The Americans were happy, but we can only speculate if the CIA knew that Barbie had anything to do with it if Barbie's bragging had been based on reality. The documentary film My Enemy's Enemy suggests that the capture had actually been orchestrated by Barbie and then the CIA working in collaboration. 
the film asserts that indeed the CIA had once again asked for Barbie's help, and that's never been admitted to in an official capacity. The filmmaker said he'd done his investigating, telling a British newspaper the Che claim came from several sources. I think it makes total sense when you understand what Barbie was doing and who he was working for in the Bolivian military, and how they admired him as a Nazi officer, and what he had done in the war. So Barbie was right at home in Bolivia hunting down leftists just as he'd hunted down Jews and resistance fighters during the war, at times torturing leftists and sometimes teaching the general's private paramilitaries how to interrogate Nazi style. We should also say that Barbie had another gig working as a spy for West Germany. They paid him 500 Deutschmarks a month to do anti-communist reconnaissance in Bolivia. This too did not look good when it finally came out. West Germany's Federal Intelligence Service described Barbie, Agent 43118, as intelligent, very receptive and adaptable, discreet and reliable. In 1966, they parted ways with Barbie to avoid later complications and difficulties, which happened anyway. It seems Barbie never gave up his love for the Nazi party. In 1966, he was drinking in the German club in La Paz and was kicked out for screaming at the top of his voice, Heil Hitler. Another person at the club at the time was the West German ambassador who, let's say, felt a bit embarrassed. People close to Barbie later backed this up, saying he never fully gave up being a Nazi and always expressed that, given a chance, he liked to help Mengele and Eichmann. Mengele died in a swimming pool in 1979 in Sao Paulo, but Nazi hunters did eventually get to Eichmann, who was hanged in Israel in 1962. As you can see, the Butcher of Leon was a very useful asset to many different organizations, but he was really close to the next Bolivian dictator, Hugo Bonzer. This was a time of massive bloodshed in Bolivia and all over South America thanks in part to the US secretly helping tyrants gain power through Operation Condor. It was a time of utter terror featuring dictators who were only too happy to remove the eyes of anyone who started talking about improving conditions for peasant farmers and the working class. It was through Operation Condor that Bonzer violently rose to power after deposing the left-wing leader Juan José Torres. Torres wasn't a communist, but he did talk about unions, inequality, you know, that kind of thing. That might have sounded a bit too commie for the US's liking. Torres had to go, and he went with some brutality later being assassinated while in exile, likely a part of Operation Condor. As you can now understand, Barbie was more than made up about bonds are coming to power. Together, they formed a lasting relationship. Oppressing and sometimes disappearing activists, journalists, and anyone who talked about lefty stuff. Documents also show that to help with these right-wing coups, Barbie arranged to bring weapons, including tanks, from Europe to Bolivia. He was useful indeed, but make no mistake, it wasn't a real friendship with Bonzer, it was just a dirty, rotten business of politics. One document states that Bonzer considered selling Barbie to France, which he thought would gain him political leverage, money, and weapons. Moving on, Barbie was then teamed up with a neo-Nazi paramilitary guy named Alvaro de Castro. When Castro was arrested some years later, he admitted that he and Barbie had done a bit of drug trafficking and also trafficked weapons from Europe to Bolivian drug lords. At this time in the 70s, the USA's hunger for cocaine had created one of the biggest businesses on the planet. If only Barbie had been given up earlier, but he wasn't done yet. Being as connected as he was and so well versed in extreme violence, Barbie did some business with Bolivia's biggest drug lord at the time, Roberto Suarez Gomez, aka the King of Cocaine. This guy made hundreds of millions of dollars from getting peasant farmers to grow cocaine for pennies, after which he sold to Pablo Escobar's Medellin cartel, who then shipped it to the US. Gomez was considered to be the biggest coke producer on the planet, so big he later financed yet another coup in Bolivia, this one becoming known as the Cocaine Coup. Barbie worked for such drug lords doing security, and you have to admit, he certainly had the resume. The Escobars and Gomez's of this world were continually hunting for their enemies, be it other traffickers or spies. They often tortured suspects, so you could say a former Nazi chief interrogator was a pretty good man to have on your team. Moving on again, Barbie became close to Escobar when he started doing his security for the transportation of Bolivian-grown coke to Colombia. For that, Escobar, a man with limitless cash, funded Barbie's anti-communist work. In a way, this even made Escobar a US friend, not just Barbie. All this time, not many people knew Barbie by his real name. He'd been using the alias Klaus Altman. But then, in 1971, it seems his identity was revealed and later some documents were discovered by French Nazi hunters. Soon, a photo of Barbie appeared in the French media. Well, 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 if it ain't the Butcher of Lyon, said a lot of people. Barbie was subsequently held in a Bolivian prison for his own protection, and by this time, no one was there to help. Still, there had to be more proof. Was this guy really the butcher? Some French journalists went to Bolivia to interview him. He denied the charges, and when shown photographs of some of the people he tortured, he denied he ever seen them. 
This went out on French TV in 1971, and at that point some of the people he'd hurt were still alive and well. It's him, thought Simone Lagrange, as she watched the clip in horror. It was the beast that she can never forget. Still, Bolivia wouldn't extradite him. Not that they could anyway, as he still denied who he really was. And you can be sure the US, West Germany, and the UK were keeping their mouths shut about all this. He was an embarrassment in the making. The New York Times even turned up at his house, with the journalists later being asked nicely by a bunch of armed men if they could quietly leave. Remember, Barbie wasn't just friends with the world's most powerful drug lords, but he'd also helped monstrous tyrants get to power and keep their power. It wasn't going to be easy to send him back to Europe. The years passed, and then in 1983, a democratic government won in Bolivia. These people were no friends to Nazi criminals. Barbie was arrested, allegedly for some money he owed, but much to his shock, he was soon sitting on a plane in handcuffs heading back to France. On February 7, 1983, the newspaper Le Monde ran the headline on its front page, he's going to pay at last. Angry crowds were there to meet him at the airport, with reports stating some people had gone there to kill him. A woman who he'd sent to Drancy internment camp had brought a 22 caliber rifle for his arrival, but it seems her shot missed. The New York Times wrote at the time, at Leon Airport, where a crowd had gathered in expectation of Mr. Barbie's arrival, the police arrested a 44-year-old woman carrying a carbine under a white sheet. The police did not identify her, but said they understood that she had spent time in a concentration camp during World War II. This is when the Justice Department started investigating the situation, and you already know the outcome of that. Oh, sorry France, we messed up. Commies, come on, those damn commies. It also turned out that the FBI had 85 pages of files from 1972 to 1987 on a man not named Klaus Altman, but Klaus Barbie. So they knew who he was all along. Many of the first-hand stories you've heard in the show were taken from the trial. He maintained throughout that they'd got the wrong man and he was Klaus Altman. On the 26th of May, 1987, he went face to face with some of his victims, after which he said, I have nothing to say. A journalist wrote about one particular moment during the trial, saying her eyewitness account made the courtroom cry. This was a woman who said Barbie had forced her to watch as he ordered his men to beat her father to death. After that, she was sent to a death camp. The prosecution had a long list of atrocities that Barbie had been involved with, including capturing those orphans, a massacre of 22 hostages in a basement of a Gestapo building, an execution of 42 people who had been involved in an uprising, and of course all that torture he'd done to people. But there was a problem. France had a statute of limitations, and for that reason all those charges could be dropped. He was no longer officially guilty for the crimes for which he was convicted in absentia of all those years ago. Too much time had passed. There was one thing the prosecution could do, though and that was to charge him not for individual offenses or murder and such, but for committing crimes against humanity. There was no statute of limitations in France for that, but now the prosecution had a much harder job on its hands. Auschwitz survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winning writer Elie Wiesel took the stand and was first asked to talk about the nature of the Holocaust. Barbie's French lawyer Jacques Vergès defending the indefensible later asked Wiesel what he thought about the Algerian kids that had died in French internment camps. Wasn't that a crime against humanity or was it just war? After all, no French generals had been hanged for that, for war crimes. Vissel told Vergès that he knew nothing about the French camps. He'd been in the US when that happened, to which Vergès roared, I conclude from it that the deaths of these children were silent. Their cries did not cross the Atlantic, let alone the Mediterranean. You are an American citizen. What do you think of the fate of the children of Milai, of whom the murderer today is still free? If you didn't know, US troops committed various war crimes in Vietnam and one which was now called the My Lai Massacre. No one was put to death because of it or barely punished. Even if those crimes were a form of inhuman brutality, it didn't mean Barbie wasn't a war criminal. Then people started whispering, if one atrocity isn't a war crime, then does that mean the other thing isn't, legally speaking anyway? Could Barbie the Smiling Torturer be innocent of crimes against humanity in view of what France had done to people, or even what the US had done to people during wartime? One writer asked, was imperialism a crime against humanity? On the last day, in his final statement, Vergès said, Does crime against humanity only force emotion or merit commemoration if it hurt Europeans? Would there be a death in a hierarchy that made the distinction between the dead dignified by memory and those dignified by being forgotten? This is a question some people have been asking ever since about various other bloody, brutal conflicts, but was it going to work for Barbie? At the end of the trial, Barbie said, I have some words to say. I did not commit the raid in his youth. I fought the resistance, and that was the war, and today the war is over. Thank you. 
It took six hours for the jury to come to a decision. Yes, they agreed Barbie was a war criminal and he had a major role in one of the most inhumane things that has ever taken place on the planet. He was found guilty of crimes against humanity, and the judge told him he'd be spending the rest of his days behind bars. He did not spend too long there, dying in prison four years later, aged 77, from leukemia and spine and prostate cancer. Soon, cops will raid Edward Gein's house, and what they'll find there won't just disturb them, it'll break them. Many will never be the same after that. But today, Edward scoops one last spoonful of soup from the bowl he's fashioned from a human skull. He then empties the remnants of the soup into a wastebasket made from skin. Today's a big day for Ed. He's finally finished stitching together a very special suit he's made. Illuminated by the light of a lamp that's covered with what looks like faces, Ed first slips on a pair of leggings that look like legs, and next he slips onto his corset, a garment that once served as part of the torso of a woman. He pulls everything tight with a belt decorated with, you guessed it, bits of what used to be a person. He's almost ready now. There's just one last piece of his new outfit to put on, a human face mask. He looks in the mirror and thinks, perfect. He's finally become his mother. His masterpiece is complete. Reeling with joy, he runs into the garden and dances under a full moon. We're talking now about possibly the strangest serial killer to have ever walked the planet. His story is like no other. Ed was truly unique in his depravity, and that's why he inspired movies such as The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Silence of the Lambs. But if there's one movie that fits Ed's life like a glove, it's Psycho. We're sure you'll agree with us after you've watched the story that Mr. Edward Gein was a true American psycho. The question is, how did he get away with his crimes for so long? Did no one in that small town of his not wonder if there was anything a little bit strange about the man? His entire house was full of things made from human body parts. To do that, he needed quite the stock of bodies. How did he get them? How did he manage to do it without the local <laughs> cops noticing? But first, let's go back in time and talk about the young Ed Gein. How did a young man become such a monster? A guy that would become known as the Butcher of Plainfield. Edward Theodore Gein was born on August 27, 1906 in a place called La Crosse County in the state of Wisconsin. His parents, George and Augusta, had one other son named Henry. Life wasn't easy for the family. George couldn't hold down a job for long and support his wife and sons for the simple fact that he devoted much of his time to something other than family. That thing was whiskey. Augusta, someone who you might call a controlling matriarch, wasn't happy with the life she had. To try and improve matters, she made the decision to move the family across counties to the small rural village of Plainfield. There, they would work on an isolated farm, barely ever seeing the 700 or so other residents of the village. The two boys went to the local school, but it seemed to the teachers that there was something wrong with the boys. Ed had this habit of just laughing out loud for no good reason. He didn't have many friends, and even if he did make friends, his mother would soon put a stop to the relationship. You see, to understand Ed's later behavior, you really need to know a thing or two about his mother. She might have had an alcoholic husband who often returned home stinking of demon liquor, a man who could barely put food on the table. But she was no angel herself. She not only despised her own husband, but she despised everyone besides her kids. The only reason she didn't ask for a divorce was that it was against her religious beliefs. When not in school, both Ed and Henry weren't allowed off the farm. Augusta's reasoning was that most people were evil. She preached to the boys daily about the depravity of mankind, reading chapters from the Bible about the fires of hell awaiting most folks. She told her kids that those who take to the bottle will meet with eternal damnation. She told them that women were loose, that they couldn't be trusted, and that they too would one day have a date with the devil. Of course, Augusta said she was not one of those women. She was moral. She had committed herself to God. Her Bible was her blueprint for life. We don't need to tell you that this kind of overbearing mothering isn't great for kids, especially when you throw demons and hellfire into the mix. We'll get to the crime soon, but you need to know a little bit more about Ed's pre-skin suit life. The whiskey eventually killed George when Ed and Henry were in their 30s. After that, both men worked on the farm and did odd jobs around the village to make ends meet. They did handy work for locals, but something Ed really enjoyed doing was babysitting. Yep, the butcher of Plainfield was great with kids, likely because his own development had been arrested due to his mother's strictness. This is what one of the townsfolk actually said about Ed's way with the kids. Good old Ed, kind of a loner and maybe a bit odd with that sense of humor of his, but just the guy to call to sit in with the kiddies. And get this, people still sent their kids to stay with Ed long after his mother died. Some of those kids told their parents that they'd seen shrunken heads and strange masks around his house, but the parents dismissed this as the kids being over-imaginative. 
so Augusta still had a firm grip on Ed's mind even though the child had grown into a man. Henry had at least managed to get into a relationship with the local woman, but Ed was still too attached to his mom to think about other women. Henry would actually talk to others about how Ed was way too obsessed with their religious zealot of a mom. And when Ed heard this, he wasn't happy. He didn't want to hear anyone talking badly about Augusta. With that in mind, what happened when Ed was 38 years old might not surprise you. There was a huge fire at the farm. Firefighters were called and managed to quell the flames, and then they left. Ed later called the police department and told the cops he couldn't find his brother. A search party went out at night, with their lanterns glowing all over the farm and they eventually found Henry. He was dead. He wasn't burned at all. He was just lying on the ground with his face in the mud. Surprisingly, the cops said no foul play. The coroner said Henry had died of asphyxiation. He said that, even though it appeared that Henry had been hit over the head with something. Was it Ed who killed Henry? Did Ed want to be the sole benefactor of his mother's adoration? Most people think yes. Had the cops worked a bit harder, they likely would have prevented the rise of the monster. Not long after Henry's downfall, Augusta suffered a terrible stroke that left her paralyzed. Now Ed had to play nurse for his mother, with her shouting orders as her devoted son ran around doing all the jobs in the house. Nothing Ed could do could save her. She had another stroke soon after and died. To say the least, the adoring son of that Bible-waving beast was devastating. The house just got messier and messier, but not in one room. Ed kept his mother's room as clean as possible, making it a shrine to her. He also boarded up many of the other rooms in the house, with his main room being the kitchen. He still babysat from time to time, but his biggest joy was reading books about Japanese and German atrocities during the Second World War. He also had a thing for detective pulp fiction. Books back then often included gory stories of cannibalism in the Pacific. Ed managed to get by by doing odd jobs, and he also enjoyed a windfall from some land he sold that had once been his brother's. What the locals in the village didn't know at this time was that Ed had lost his head. The death of his mother had traumatized him to the extent he was dangerously psychotic. He had become deranged and there was no going back. We don't know the exact time when Ed started playing around with corpses, but it's thought that during the late 40s and early 50s he was grave digging and killing. He'd sometimes wait until someone had been buried and then he'd sneak off to the graveyard in the middle of the night and exhume the corpse. He's now called a necrophiliac serial killer, which means he gratified himself sexually with the bodies before he got to work on making things from them. Let's now fast forward in time and tell you about what the cops saw when they entered the property and had the shock of their lives. A shock some people say killed the local sheriff. What he saw that day was so terrible, so unthinkable, he was overwhelmed with feelings of disgust, horror, and sadness. He died soon after from heart failure. It was the deputy sheriff that first arrived on the property. He opened a barn door and before his eyes he saw a dead woman hanging upside down from a beam. To him she looked like an animal that had been killed and was in the process of being butchered. She had already been split down the middle and her internal organs had been removed. It was enough to make the cop vomit on the spot. Her head had been removed and the tendons in her ankles had been cut and a rod thread through them. It sure was a sight to behold. Worse still, the police found her head in a burlap bag. Ed had driven a nail in each of her ears and fastened a string to them as if to make a kind of hanging trophy. There was much worse to come. The rest of the police department arrived on the scene. Now it was time to check the rooms of the main house. In the kitchen, they discovered Ed had likely been thinking about doing some cooking. On the stove was the heart of a woman, kept next to a bunch of cooking pots. Cops would later say Ed was no doubt a cannibal as well as a necrophile. And what really turned the stomachs of the town folks was that they'd often eaten packages of meat Ed had given to them. Did that make them cannibals too? Inside the houses, they found stacks of human bones. They found at least 10 severed heads. Some of those heads had the faces peeled off of them. They ended up becoming Ed's face mask collection. To make them more realistic, he'd adorned some of their lips with lipstick. One of the cops who saw those masks remarked that the people were very recognizable. One of the faces of a recent victim had only just been removed and Ed had placed that one in a paper bag. The cops weren't anywhere near finished with their search. They found the skin waste basket we told you about. They found chairs with human skin coverings. There were skulls with the top sawn off, female genitals stored in a shoe box. They found noses, lips attached to a drawstring, female fingernails, a human skin lampshade, skulls on bedposts, and of course, Ed's pièce de résistance, his human bodysuit replete with the breasts of a woman. So after his arrest, how did Ed explain himself? He admitted that he robbed the graves of women, 
He wanted his mother back, and making things from the body parts of women was kind of like having his mother around all the time. By making a woman suit, he could actually become his mother. It turned out that those kids had been right, and indeed Ed had kept shrunken heads in his house. One kid, a 16-year-old who sometimes went to see ball games with Ed, said Ed always had told him the heads and faces were all stuff he'd collected that had come from the Philippines. That wasn't true. They were all local women. Cops did wonder how a man could dig up a grave all by himself in just one night, but when they went to the graves of the victims, sure enough, the women or most of the women were missing from their coffins. Occasionally, Ed would take what he needed from the body and later return the body parts he wasn't interested in. So what led the police to Ed's house in the first place? That was because the police went to a local store and found a trail of blood, the blood of a woman named Bernice Warden. Ed had shot her and slit her throat, and then he proceeded to drag her body out of the store and take it to his house. Hers was the body hanging from that beam, and Ed had literally left a trail of blood for police to follow. The cops also found out from Bernice's son that Ed had been in the store the day before and said he'd come back in a day or two to buy a gallon of antifreeze. On the floor of the store, the cops found a bloodied receipt for a gallon of antifreeze. Ed didn't immediately admit to his crime, but the cops used a tried and tested technique to get him to confess. It was simple enough. They just made him look at the corpse of the woman he killed and mutilated, and in the end, he cracked. He also admitted to killing a tavern keeper he knew well, a woman named Mary Hogan. A mask made from her face was found in his house. At first, the cops didn't believe that all those body parts in Ed's house had been robbed from graves. What they thought they had on their hands was one of the most prolific serial killers in US history. But as we said, Ed told them about the graves he'd robbed and he wasn't lying. He also said he only killed people when the ground was so hard from the cold it made exhuming bodies impossible. He guessed his grave robbing lasted from 1947 to 1952 and he added that at times he'd been helped by a man named Gus who stopped helping Ed when he was forced to live in a home for the elderly. We probably don't need to tell you that the Wisconsin State Crime Lab had never heard a story like this before. At first, Ed was reluctant to open up to investigators, but the longer he was with them, the more he talked. They listened as he explained the thing he liked to do the most was put on his tan skin suit, don one of his face masks, put female sex organs over his male sex organs, and then run around in the garden, especially when it was a full moon. That may sound about as crazy as crazy can get, but with only two murders under his belt, how come Ed Gein is called a serial killer? Isn't it three or more kills that gets a person into the serial killer hall of infamy? Well, it's generally thought Ed killed quite a few more people. Remember, he lived in a pretty remote area, and so we can tell you that other people went missing around the places where Ed frequented, and well, the cops thought he likely was behind those disappearances. Police found the genitals of girls in Ed's house, and it's now believed that they belong to some missing local girls. It's also believed that Ed was behind the disappearances of two deer hunters who left the Plainfield Tavern one night and were never seen again. One of the missing men's jacket and his dead dog were found on the Gein farm. The judge who presided over Ed's trial later wrote that there was little doubt Ed had killed more than two people. That judge found Ed not guilty by reason of insanity and sent him to serve out his sentence at Central State Hospital for the criminally insane. It's actually quite unusual for serial killers to receive this verdict, but we don't think many people would disagree with the judge in this case. Ed Gein almost certainly had a case of what's called the Oedipal Complex, a psychosexual condition in which a child desires his parent of the opposite sex. Ed's mother's fanatic talk of God and the devil and telling her sons that all women were bad except for her no doubt was the foundation of Ed's obsession with her and his exclusion from other women. He actually told the police in what they said was a chatty way that he was also obsessed with the power of women but unable to actually be close to a living woman. He decided he'd surround himself with dead ones. He told police his victims were usually quite plump, just like his beloved mom. He always denied he had intercourse with the bodies, saying they smelled too bad. The cops didn't believe him but were taken aback when Ed told them he took great pleasure in skinning women. The police said what was surprising was the cheerful, matter-of-fact way he spoke. It seemed to them as if Ed felt he hadn't really done anything wrong. Ed Gein died from lung cancer and respiratory illness in 1984 at the age of 77. If there is such a thing as an afterlife, he's probably quite made up since he's buried with his mother. There's just one problem though. Henry also takes up space in that plot. As for that old farmhouse, the building that was the inspiration for the house in the movie Psycho, it was burned down in 1958 while Ed was serving time. It was no accident, of course, but no one was ever arrested. When Ed was told his dear mother's house was gone, that his childhood home had been destroyed, he replied, just as well. 
Believe it or not, the nurses who were charged with taking care of Ed said he was a lovely man, although some of them said he liked to stare a lot. He was docile most of the time and proved to be quite excellent at sewing and other handicrafts. They said he was a pillar of the community. Friendly neighbors watched from their windows as he shoveled snow for the elderly. He became Pogo the Clown for the local children, who guffawed at his tricks and happily received a balloon for being such a good boy or girl. A close friend to politicians and professionals, when the mask finally was removed from this sadistic killer, society was shaken to its very core. John Wayne Gacy was a man who said in custody, I've taken three and a half hours of truth serum, sodium amytal, the maximum amount I could have. It shows I have no knowledge of the crime whatsoever. That's strange because his crimes were certainly memorable. When Gacy was not making kids laugh at tricks, he did one-on-one -on -one shows in his house that involved asking a young man to wear a pair of handcuffs to try to get out of him. Having already seen that Gacy was a respectable member of the local community, the victim gladly slipped his hands into the cuffs. His captor would then fasten a noose around his neck, pulling it tighter in increments. This was about the time when the victim knew there was no trick, and Gacy was certainly no pillar of the community. But let's go back to the start. Like many serial killers in the making, the young Gacy suffered a troubled upbringing. He stuffed his trauma down into the far reaches of his brain, but it wouldn't be long before his horrifying past resurfaced in new ways when he grew up. Gacy was an outcast as a young boy and had a father who was quick to reprimand the youngster. Gacy was powerless. This doesn't often bode well for the adult in the making. But at the age of 18, it looked as though Gacy was doing all right. That's when he became the assistant precinct captain for a local Democratic Party politician. Seemed like young Gacy was becoming a respectable young man. Still, he could never do any good in his father's eyes. His pop, an ugly human if there ever was one, was often calling his son sissy boy and other similar slurs. John Wayne Gacy was homosexual, but you can understand why he tried his hardest to repress his sexual urges and feelings with a father like that. A leading detective on the case will say Gacy was actually a homophobic homosexual, his denial being so strong. Gacy moved away from his father and ended up working as a mortuary assistant in Las Vegas. There he took perhaps a too keen interest in the embalming of bodies. One day he got into a coffin of a recently deceased man. He hugged the body, he stroked the slick embalmed skin. For those few moments he didn't feel powerless at all. He then jumped out of the coffin in a state of shock. With actual living young men becoming intimate posed more problems. Even though Gacy got married, it was just a charade. When he became a manager at a KFC outlet, he'd often invite young male workers back to his house to play pool and drink alcohol. He'd usually come on to them, and when they pushed him away, he'd just say he was kidding. The guys usually weren't gay. And even if they were, Gacy was hardly attractive. His solution to those unreciprocated advances was simple and vile. Abduct them first, torture them, and kill them. He did this many times and it seems he did so without so much as stirring anyone's curiosity. He was, after all, a community leader, an organizer of parades, a successful businessman and fundraiser whose mask remained tight against his doughy face. He was, as people later said, the devil in disguise. But let's be frank here, viewers. Had any of you more discerning people known Gacy back then and really talked to him, you'd have known he was screwy in about 20 minutes. If you'd hung around him for a few weeks, you'd likely have seen his massive stash of pornography. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but you'd have to notice that he spent as much time hanging out with guys in their late teens as he did with his wife and children. You'd then have found out that he had two clown characters, Pogo the nice clown and Patches the sometimes devilish clown. You wouldn't have had to read Sigmund Freud to figure out that this was a two-sided man. Sometimes he'd keep the clown outfit on, and you'd later see him collapsed over a beer in a local bar. Had you not come to the conclusion by then that Mr. Gacy might have been hiding something perhaps a little dark, your intuitive faculties were as dull as a potato's. But you didn't even need heightened intuition to see what he was like. He sexually harassed a number of his staff, all young men. He once told one of them, do you know how easy it would be to get one of my guns and kill you, and how easy it would be to get rid of the body? You might have even seen how young men went into his house and never came out. You could have talked with the young man who Gacy tried to handcuff, likely with the intent to kill, only to be out-wrestled. Gacy told that guy, Not only are you the only one who got out of the cuffs, you got them on me. There were other survivors too. If you were a young guy back then, living anywhere near that neighborhood, you would have heard of Mr. Gacy, the creepy clown who couldn't keep his hands to himself. If you'd been able to look deeper, you would have seen he served time in prison for assault on a young man. So this begs the question, how come he wasn't investigated? It was partly because people back then, even the police, didn't expect serial killers to look from the outside as upstanding members of the community. Gacy wasn't just a pillar of the community, he was the lodestone. 
especially once he'd gotten his painting, decorating, and maintenance business off the ground. His political work even got him a photograph with the First Lady Rosalind Carter. If there was a serial killing university degree, the first thing you learn in evasion tactics class is that if you want to become a prime wolf, you first have to know how to perfect playing the lamb. It also helps to earn money, since money and power afford a killer cloaking device, as the United States Secret Service, which gave Gacy special clearance. Okay, let's now get down to the business of how he was finally caught. On December 11, 1978, a woman named Elizabeth Peist went to the local drugstore to pick up her teenage son who worked there. She was in great spirits that day, it was her birthday, and she had invited all her friends to her party. The devoted son Robert had helped her get things ready for the party. Robert told his mom to wait in the parking lot. He said he just had to speak to a guy about a possible summer job, a job that paid a whole lot more than his drugstore gig. All Miss Pice was told was that the guy offering the job worked in construction. Robert had met him when the guy went to the drugstore to talk about possible maintenance. Elizabeth sat in the car, giddy about the party to come and glad her son was helping out with making sure everything went well. But then 20 minutes passed and he still hadn't come out of the store. She never saw him again. She couldn't enjoy the party that evening with her son still not having contacted her. Not even a phone call just to say he got waylaid. Later that night, when everyone had left, she called the police and reported Robert missing, informing them about the contractor he said he was meeting. The cops soon discovered that the contractor was 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy. This guy was known to almost everyone in the community. In three different cities, he'd been voted Man of the Year by the Junior Chamber of Commerce. He had a successful business and had even met the president's wife. When the cops looked more into the man, they found out he often visited the local hospital children's ward. There, playing Pogo the Clown to seriously ill kids, he bounced around doing tricks. One was handcuffing the kids and then pretending he'd lost the key and telling them they'd stay that way forever. Another was running around and tying them up with rope. The children couldn't get enough of it. When police interviewed his neighbors, they told him Gacy was a lovely guy, despite going through two divorces and not seeing his two kids much. Every Christmas, his house was always the one with the most Christmas lights. When it snowed, he never failed to go out in the street and shovel old folks' driveways. So police didn't immediately think, ah, serial killing sadist. In fact, they might have left Gacy alone had he not denied going to the drugstore that day Robert went missing. Witnesses had put him there. This encouraged the cops to dig a little deeper. They only had to scrape the surface to find the part-time party clown had been imprisoned in the past for attacking a teenager. They also saw that similar charges had been dropped in another case that mirrored that one. What was just as shocking was a police report from 1978 which Gacy had invited a 28-year-old man to smoke some weed in his car. He told police at the time that Gacy knocked him out by putting a rag soaked in chloroform over his mouth. Gacy took him back to his house and assaulted him. Police didn't charge Gacy, and the matter was settled over a $3,000 payout. Now, a few months later, he'd been connected to a missing teen. Police had to investigate. Too many things just seemed wrong about Gacy. Police got a warrant and went to search his house. They found all kinds of books and films related to sex, a starting pistol, a length of nylon rope, drugs that can make someone sleepy, police badges, and if that wasn't suspicious enough, lots of IDs and underwear that did not belong to Gacy. In his bedroom was a giant clown painting. Close to that was a TV alarm clock and radio, unbeknownst to cops, something that had belonged to one of his victims. On closer inspection, police found their piece de resistance, a drugstore receipt in a wastebasket that had one point been in Robert Peist's pocket. They didn't know this just yet. Police also found a class of 1975 Maine West High School ring. On it was the initials JAS. They didn't know it at the time, but the ring belonged to one of Gacy's former employees, John Allen Syke, who became a victim himself. They surveilled his house after that and followed him everywhere he went. Gacy seemed to enjoy this at first, going over to the police car outside his house and telling the cops where he was about to go. As time went on, he said the police were harassing him for no good reason, all the time trying to prove how important he was. One time, detectives went to lunch with Gacy. They asked him about his clown thing. Gacy said he loved being pogo. Being a clown, he said, meant you could go out in public and grab women, and all they did was laugh about it. He told them, being a clown, you can get away with murder. Police then interviewed one of his former employees, who told them Gacy once asked him to spread a lime in a crawl space under his house. That's when they started working on getting a second search warrant. One day, Gacy lost his temper and went out to the surveillance vehicle. He said to the cops, come inside, have a coffee, look around, there's nothing to see. Meanwhile, the neighbors wondered why those horrible cops were harassing poor Mr. Gacy. In the house, one of the cops noticed something when he flushed the toilet. It wasn't physical, it was a smell. A smell every detective knows well. Death. That second warrant couldn't come soon enough. Soon after, Gacy turned up at his lawyer's office looking rattled and drunk. 
He told his lawyers he had something to say. When they asked what, he pulled out the newspaper pointing at the article about the missing boy Robert Peist. Gacy said, the boy's dead. He's dead. He's in a river. Through the night, the drunk Gacy said he'd been the jury, judge, and executioner of many, many people. He said some were under the house and others were in the river, although Gacy was worse for wear throughout his rambling. He wasn't under arrest at this point and so left, now badly hungover. He wouldn't remain a free man long, but while he was, he drove over to meet a friend and said, I've been a bad boy. I killed 30 people, give or take a few. On December 21st, police got the second warrant to search his house. As they looked around, they found a kind of trap door. That led to a crawl space, so one of the detectives got in and started crawling along the tunnel. His nostrils were immediately filled with the stench of decomposition. He shouted up to the other detectives, I think this place is full of kids. At first, police found three bodies all in various stages of rot. They also found bits of bodies. What they were looking at was perhaps one of the USA's worst serial killers. Turned out Gacy had been killing for a while, even when he was living with his second wife. Once she was out of the house, he lured young men back to his place on the promise of booze and weed. He'd often play his clown game with them, strapping handcuffs over their wrists to see if they could get out. They'd become worried, and then he would strangle them. He usually did this slowly, first by putting the rope around their neck and telling them it too was a game. He gradually fastened it tighter and tighter by twisting a stick until they could hardly breathe. He tortured some of his victims while they were in this state of terminal distress. His wife would often complain about the horrid smell, to which Gacy would always blame dead rats. When she complained too much, he told her to mind her own business. She asked about all the clothes and wallets she found, seemingly from the young men. Again, Gacy told her not to pry into his personal business. That's when she left. Police interviewed survivors, mostly poor kids and prostitutes he found on the streets. Although Gacy was open to picking up any kind of hitchhiker, he'd take them back to his house and show them that photo of himself with the first lady. This was usually enough to make the men feel safe. The only reason they survived was that they outright refused to play the handcuff game with him. They didn't tell the cops, for the sad fact that most of them saw police as the enemy. If they did take part in the trick, they died. Gacy told police that when he was tightening that rope around his victim's neck, for the final time he would often recite the 23rd Psalm. It starts with the line, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And later comes the unforgettable line, Yeah, walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. God knows what might have been going through the minds of his victims. Gacy was doing most of the killing when he was the most famous for playing pogo, so he could have killed and entertained a bunch of sick kids or the children of his politician friends. As for why he did it, Gacy once told FBI profiler Robert Ressler that all his victims were just worthless little queers and punks. He later denied the murders, saying he'd been set up. In his many interviews, he said the media made him into some kind of monster. He said, they've created this fantasy monster image and it's been going on for the last 12 years and I never had no comment and I had no need to talk to the media for the simple reason that they were looking for sensationalism. They were looking for the monster. It wasn't exactly a cogent defense, seeing as a mass of bodies were found under his house and their belongings inside of his house. In a separate interview, Gacy said, if you want to say I slept in the house of a dead body, okay fine, I'll buy that. But in the same room? No. And besides, the dead won't bother you, it's the living you gotta worry about. He once created a document when in correspondence to the New Yorker, it was a Q&A which he answered himself. Here are some of the answers, just to give you more insight into how he either fooled himself or was an outright liar. My biggest regret, being so trusting and gullible, taken advantage of. Favorite song, Send in the Clowns, Amazing Grace. I consider myself liberal with values. Gacy told the interviewer he hadn't committed the murders. He said at one point, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to make no damn Ted Bundy's last minute confessions. The interviewer didn't expect him to, nor did he believe much of what Gacy had said over many hours of chats. Gacy should have been caught much earlier, or at least should have set off a few lights in the radar of the local police departments. In 1975, an 18-year-old former employee of Gacy named John Butkovich had an argument with him over some missing pay. Butkovich went missing after that. Gacy was interviewed by the cops, but nothing came of it. Remember, this was a man with a very sketchy record of hurting young men. The boy's parents called the cops over 100 times, each time demanding that they investigate Gacy. They didn't. Gacy later told police that he got Butkovich stoned and drunk and then inveigled him to put the handcuffs on behind his back. Gacy said he sat on him for at least an hour before strangling him. He then had to rush to bury the body since his wife and kids said they were coming back. During the trial, the prosecutor said John Gacy has accounted for more human devastation than many earthly catastrophes, but one must tremble. I tremble when thinking about just how close he came to getting away with it all. 
that is true. He could have gotten away with so many murders. Maybe it was his political connections and air of importance that helped him escape the eyes of the police. That and the fact that he was man of the year. There was also linkage blindness, meaning different police departments didn't or couldn't link up his earlier offenses. Still, maybe Gacy wasn't working alone. An investigator later said there was overwhelming evidence Gacy worked with an accomplice. He could have also been part of some depraved ring, which is what many people now think. There's fairly convincing evidence that he was involved with a man who operated such a ring. Gacy was convicted of 33 murders in all. On May 10, 1994, he received a lethal injection. He had no last words, although some dubious sources state he said, kiss my… you need to fill in that final word yourself. Cursing offends some people. After beer number one, the teenage Jeffrey Dahmer, already a budding alcoholic, sits in his hideaway fantasizing about a male jogger he often sees running down the street. For some strange reason, his attraction to this fully grown man is somehow connected to the thrill he gets from dissecting roadkill. Young Dahmer has no idea how his obsession with collecting bones and cutting apart dead animals will be intertwined with his lust. He opens another beer, and then another, and so on until he's drunk. He peers through the window of his hut. There's a blue sky above. A blue jay perches on the branch of a tree and lets out its unmistakable screech. He scrunches a beer can and opens another. Nature, he thinks while looking at the bird. I must be a freak of nature. He's aware that something could be wrong with him. He wants to kill. He knows it's not right, but it's a feeling he just can't push back. He gets his baseball bat and waits behind a bush for the jogger to run down that same route again. Young Jeff doesn't know what he'll do, not really. Maybe he'll knock him out, he thinks, and then keep the body. It just so happens that the man didn't jog that day. These were the warped thoughts of a boy that would become known as the Milwaukee Monster, a deserving epithet if there ever was one. Dahmer's atrocious crimes not only shocked the nation, but his actions have perplexed medical science. He may have been a monster, but Dahmer was also soft-spoken, intelligent, and strange as it sounds, he came across as a likable guy. That's perhaps one reason why it took so long to arrest him. He almost operated in full view of the cops. He was hardly a mastermind when it came to concealing his crimes. In fact, it's as if sometimes he wanted to be caught, and yet it took so long. We might ask how the killer was caught, but in Dahmer's case another question needs to be asked. How didn't anyone realize he was a distressed and messed up kid? He came from a broken family, a family that was likely a little more broken than documentary films have made out. His mother, it seems, was what you might have called the overbearing type of matriarch. She was moody, often depressed, argumentative, and she wanted constant attention. This kind of behavior does not bode well for her children in the family. She was a wreck, and by the time Dahmer was old enough to go to school, she was spending most of her days in bed. The household wasn't much fun at all for young Dahmer, especially since his father was away so much of the time. When he was back, the parents argued all the time. This is something that affected Dahmer deeply, more so after his mother tried and failed to take her own life. But by the time she was pregnant with another child, she wasn't much better. So this could have been the genesis of a killer in the making. But then a lot of kids grow up in chaotic households and they end up just fine. Many serial killers experience extreme physical violence from their parents when they're young, but with Dahmer, it was more being put on the sidelines as his mother fell apart that seemed to bother him. He didn't like being abandoned, and that may explain his utter depravity later in life. After he was arrested, he always said his parents' blustery relationship didn't make him the way he was, but it would be hard to deny it shaped his very peculiar personality. His father was an analytical chemist, and unbeknownst to him, it was teaching his son some things about science, which would lead to some of the grisliest crimes the USA, or the world for that matter, has seen in modern times. He taught his son how to bleach and preserve bones, something Dahmer evidently took on board even at such a young age. Sometimes, the two of them would look around the garden and under the house for dead animals. When they found one, the father would show his son how you could bleach the skin and connective tissue from an animal. Young Dahmer was obsessed with this but not in a way his father thought. Jeff loved the end product, a pile of shiny bones. These he and his father used to call fiddlesticks. Later in life, a forensic psychiatrist named Carl Wallstrom asked Dahmer if he ever tortured animals as a child. Hurting defenseless animals is often said to be something serial killers in the making do. It's about control, about living out sadistic fantasies. Dahmer told Wallstrom a story. He said when he was in grade school, the teacher asked his class to bring something in. The next day, Dahmer brought a tadpole. At the end of the day, the teacher gave that tadpole to another kid in class. Dahmer was absolutely infuriated, so much so he went around to that kid's house. There he saw the tadpole in an aquarium. He poured gasoline in it and set it on fire. After telling that story, Dahmer turned to the psychiatrist and said, if you want to call that torturing animals, I tortured animals. 
His parents moved around. When they were together, they argued all the time. The kid got hardly any attention, less so after his brother was born. It gave him plenty of time to think, to go out exploring the nearby woodlands. He'd find dead animals and dissect them in the backyard shed. Once, he even impaled a dog's head on a stick and stuck it in the forest near his house. We won't get into everything here, but as his father later admitted, there were signs that weren't seen. Dahmer was quiet, sometimes moody. He had a shed full of animal parts. He spent much of his free time looking for roadkill. But his parents, as consumed as they were with their own disagreements, failed to see those signs. This was a kid who likely could have been fixed, but instead his problems were being ignored. In 1978, just a few weeks after he graduated high school, he took his first life. He was living alone at this point in his parents' old house. He picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks, just a young man himself at 18. The two went back to Dahmer's place to drink some beer. Dahmer later said that he found his new friend attractive, but when the conversation turned to attractive girls and how to meet them, he became aware that there'd be no love for him. For a few years, he'd known he was gay. When they were both drunk and the other guy said he wanted to leave, Dahmer went over to a set of weights. He picked up a large dumbbell, walked over to the guy who was sitting in a chair with his back to him, and he whacked him over the head. He subsequently strangled him, stripped him, used his body for sexual gratification, and like the dead animals he'd been so obsessed with, dissected him. Dahmer buried the body, but a few weeks later he dug it up. He then methodically stripped the bones of their flesh and dissolved what he could in acid. The solution that was left over he flushed down the toilet. As for the bones that were left, he crushed them with a sledgehammer and then threw the fragments around in a nearby forest. After the murder, he tried his hand at higher education, but his persistent drinking wasn't exactly conducive to attaining good grades. He soon dropped out and joined the United States Army just prior to his 19th birthday. We won't go into everything that happened in the Army, but it's reported that he drugged and molested soldiers while stationed in Germany. This is something that became known much later. His drinking habits never really diminished, and by the time he was just shy of 22, he was discharged from the Army. At this point in time, his father and stepmother had seen how alcohol was destroying his life. That's the main reason why they sent him to live with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin. She'd always had a calming effect on Dahmer and they'd hoped she'd guide him out of the darkness. This worked, to some extent. But after being fired from a job, he started drinking a lot again and acting out his fantasies. This started by exposing himself to women and children, something he was arrested for. At age 22, he paid $50 after being charged with indecent exposure. Soon after, he landed a job at a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, but his mind was far from settled. It was at this time he started thinking about control again, how he might enact his lurid fantasies on someone who could not say no. At first, he stole a mannequin and used that, but his grandmother was somewhat disturbed by the fact that he had one of those things stuffed into his wardrobe. She made him throw it out. So Dahmer, even more frustrated, was now looking for a human doll to play with. It was around that time that he started frequenting the local gay bars and discos, although his favorite places for finding men were bathhouses. He met men, and at times he had some good times with them, but he was never content because of the fact that they also had some control. If that's confusing, this is what he said after his arrest. I trained myself to view people as objects of pleasure instead of people. His solution was to ply people with alcohol. Remember, he could drink a lot, so they would usually be the first to reach the point of passing out. He also dropped sleeping pills into their drinks when they weren't looking. It's thought he did this at least 12 times after meeting people in bathhouses. He would wait until they were out and then he would have his way with them. These were not murders, but the crimes were heinous in themselves. What's strange is that Dahmer was never arrested, likely because no one pressed charges. He was, though, banned from the bathhouses. When he was 26, yet again he was charged with indecent exposure. He got a one-year probationary sentence for that. Had anyone been able to join a few dots, Dahmer's actions certainly would have portrayed a man on the edge, a dangerous man. But as things went, those dots were spread far and wide and the only person that regularly saw him was his grandmother. Nonetheless, Dahmer knew that to satisfy himself, he had to take a different course than exposing himself in public and drugging men he met in saunas. That's when he got the idea to go back to his old ways, how to keep the dead, how to conceal the dead, to do what he wanted to to the dead. He began his killing spree. He said the first murder of this new era was an accident. It happened in 1987 when Dahmer was 27. He said he woke up in a hotel and the guy was dead beside him in the bed with blood coming from his mouth. Dahmer left the hotel, got his hands on a large suitcase, and then transported the body back to his grandma's house. There, he dismembered it and got rid of most of it. He kept the head, which he boiled so he could keep the skull for his own sexual gratification. He killed again, much in the same fashion. 
drugging, strangling, and then dismembering bodies, often keeping skulls. When he was done with those skulls, he'd pulverize them with a hammer and disperse the fragments someplace. Did his grandmother know something strange was going on? She actually asked him to leave, not being too fond of him always bringing men back to his room. She even complained about the foul smells in the house, a consequence of human decay. But she never once thought her grandson was a killer. He didn't stop. He couldn't stop. He killed more, and as his addiction got worse, he took more risks. He later said he found his fifth victim so attractive that he kept the head intact and preserved it. He kept some of the other body parts, too. He flayed the corpse in his grandmother's bathtub, got rid of the parts he didn't want, and stored the rest in his room. In 1989, two days after his 29th birthday, he was given five years probation and one year in the House of Correction for a sexual assault. He spent some time behind bars, but was allowed to work, too. Almost exactly a year after his sentencing, he returned to his grandmother's house to pick up his things, the most valuable to him being the human remains. At his new apartment he started again, he picked up male prostitutes, he drugged people he met in bars. When they were unconscious, he strangled them. Sometimes he'd pose with their dead bodies. Sometimes he'd sleep with them. Often he'd take photos with them. One time he talked to a severed head while dismembering other parts of the body. All the time this was going on, he told his probation officer how horribly he felt that he was lonely and depressed, that he often thought about taking his own life. He even alluded to his depraved sexuality, but strangely nothing ever came of it. To most people, he seemed like a nice enough guy with a few problems on his mind. Believe it or not, residents of the apartment complex where he lived had told their landlord they were tired of listening to all the noises coming from that one flat. They said they often heard loud crashes, like heavy objects falling. They said a guy in there even used a chainsaw in the middle of the night. They also couldn't stand the terrible smells coming from that apartment, what smelled like dead animals. No one put two and two together. It was as if Dahmer was invisible, untouchable. Then in 1991, something straight out of the darkest kind of horror story happened. Dahmer had lured a teenager to his apartment, this time not only subdued the guy with drinks and pills, but when the victim was almost out, he drilled a hole in his skull and injected hydrochloric acid into the hole. It was Dahmer's belief that by putting the acid into the so-called executive suite, the part of the brain called the frontal cortex, he could turn him into a living zombie. He could have someone forever, but that person wouldn't rot like all of his other victims. He left the young man alone on the couch in his zombified state, drank some beer, and then went to a bar. When he returned home, he hoped his zombie would still be there. He wasn't. Dahmer looked for him and saw three women standing over him as he crouched in the street, looking awfully worse for wear. Dahmer tried to convince the women that he was the youth's friend, but they knew something was wrong. They told Dahmer they'd called the cops. The police turned up quite quickly, but after hearing Dahmer tell them he was the boyfriend of the youth, they believed him. Even when the women told them Dahmer had tried to kidnap the kid and it was evident he was bleeding from a certain orifice, a cop said to one of the women, shut the hell up. They wrote it down as a domestic dispute. As you'll see, this interaction in the street would later cause problems for the police. This is yet another time Dahmer should have been caught. Given his background, this was one hell of a big clue. The cops walked Dahmer and the allegedly drunk boy back up to his apartment where one of the police noticed a really foul odor. Little did he know that it was the decomposing body of a previous victim. When the cops were gone, Dahmer injected more hydrochloric acid into the head of the youth. This time, it killed him. He killed again, and he took his trophies again. With another man, he tried injecting water into the brain. That didn't create a zombie either. There were more murders and more of Dahmer doing despicable things with body parts. At this time, bits of people were piling up in that apartment. Police still hadn't linked any of the missing people to Dahmer. Then he met 32-year-old Tracy Edwards. This changed everything. He lured Edwards to his apartment too, but after struggling to get one handcuff on him, Edwards became suspicious. He noticed not only an oil drum, but a disgusting smell pervading the place. Dahmer also had a tape of The Exorcist Part 3 playing. Suffice to say, things didn't look good. He knew he had to talk his way out of this. Dahmer then grabbed a knife. He told Edwards he wanted to take photos with him. He put his head against Edwards' chest, saying something about his heartbeat, and then in a calm tone said he was going to rip that heart out and eat it. Time passed, however, mostly because Edwards was able to keep a conversation going. When he had his chance, he punched Dahmer in the face and made a run for it. Out on the street, naked, almost hysterical, he jumped in front of a police car. Shouting at the cops, he said a crazed man had threatened to kill him. He showed them the handcuff still attached to one of his hands. He told them he'd been captive for five hours. This time, the cops took it seriously. They had no idea, they couldn't have any idea, of what they were about to find. First was a knife. Then one of them opened a drawer and pulled out some photographs. He almost fell back in shock. 
They were pictures of bodies, some dismembered, lying in certain poses. The cop went over to his partner and said, these are for real. They then wrestled Dahmer to the floor, whereupon Dahmer managed to squeeze out the words, for what I did, I should be dead. Once in restraints, he showed them why. He opened the fridge door. Inside was a human head. Personnel from the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office were soon on the scene working with the Milwaukee Police Department to photograph the apartment. They found a bunch of tools that could be used for dismembering bodies. They also found seven skulls, some of them painted. Elsewhere, there were four human heads, three partially skeletonized bodies, a human heart, and what was described as large muscle fillets packaged in plastic bags. They found a little food, and so it looked to them that Dahmer had been eating the bodies. The so-called fillets were all frozen, just like little packages of pork. So there were the body parts. There were the drugs he used to sedate people. There were the photos, and there were the tools Dahmer had used. Forensic pathologists were soon able to say what the cause of death was with some of the victims, and they were able to make identifications. They discovered the skulls into which Dahmer had drilled, understanding what kind of injury that had caused. At this point, no one knew much about Dahmer. But when questioned, he told police he tried to create zombie sex slaves by lobotomizing his victims. He didn't deny what he'd done, and instead gave information that helped police identify his victims. Out of the 11 bodies found in his apartment, four could be identified with fingerprints. Other victims' IDs were at the apartment. The rest could be identified through dental records. Later, activists say the reason the police work had been shoddy was because of the fact that the victims had been gay. The majority of the victims had also been African American. On top of that, some people said because most of the victims had been poor, it was a case of the less dead gone missing. Meaning police don't work as hard when the victims are folks who live on the margins of society. But it was the 14-year-old who police had helped Dahmer take back to his apartment that really got the public angry. That's why there were headlines like this, anger building over role of police in Dahmer case. The boy was Laotian. Two of the women who tried to help him were black, which led people to say the white police officers hadn't paid enough attention to them out of some harbored racism. They believed Dahmer instead, who as you know, killed the kid shortly after. The cop later defended himself saying there was just nothing that stood out or we would have seen it. I've been doing this for a while and usually if something stands out, you'll spot it. There just wasn't anything there. On February 15, 1992, Dahmer was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms in prison. Another life sentence was later added on. In total, he killed 17 people. At the end of 1994, while serving time in prison, Dahmer was attacked by a man in the bathroom of the gym. He was bludgeoned with a metal bar to the point of death, and he did die shortly after in the hospital. The guy that killed him, also in for murder, later said Dahmer didn't make a single noise throughout the assault. When Dahmer's mother was approached by the media, she said, Now is everybody happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death, is that good enough for everyone? For a lot of Americans, it was a fitting end to a terrible story. Now you need to watch H.H. H. Holmes, the most horrific serial killer in U.S. history? Or have a look at this.